Time is now 5.13 and we'll call this meeting of the VIA Metropolitan Board of Trustees uh, to order. We'll begin with a moment of reflection. Let me ask Ms. Brusenio to lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge, pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Mr. Arndt, any uh, announcements? Yeah, sure. Um, at your place uh, this, e this evening, you have a small packet of winning artwork from VIA's annual youth art contest. Students uh, from grades pre-K through high school produced about 6,000 pieces of artwork on this year's theme, which was Go VIA, Go Green. And judges selected a first and second place winner in each grade level, and those are what are contained in your packet there. The best in show winner, and it's on display over here, and we have it on, on a wrapped bus that should be out front when we leave here, First, best of the best in show winner is Madeline Cortez of Clark High School. Madeline's in the audience. Madeline, please stand. <laughs> Madeline has taken first or best for five of the last six years. Now, this is her senior year. She's graduating from high school with a 4.0 grade point average, which is, deserves another round of applause. Congratulations. So she and <laughs> uh, she and all winners uh, were honored earlier this month at awards luncheon at the Southwest School of Arts in downtown. So congratulations, Maddie. Thank you. Uh, last Saturday, the region received its February, March, and April rainfall allocation within a 24-hour period. Uh, so I'd like to recognize the efforts of, of many in our staff that uh, ensured the safety of the riding public throughout this uh, day. I'm sure everyone here has seen the picture of the one bus that ended up stranded um, with the go spurs on the destination sign. Uh, this incident occurred at about 7 a.m. at McCullough, on McCullough at Massey, just as the word was traveling through the radio network that we had rising water. So by about 9 o'clock, we grounded service for the safety of our passengers and our equipment because there were no certain safe routes through the city at that time. Uh, we advise all operators to pull over in a safe lo location and then in the afternoon about three o'clock resume service. In the meantime, we were contacting via trans patrons who had not been yet picked up so they would know what was going on. We talk talked to dialysis centers to make sure that if they could book uh, alternative treatment times that that could be accommodated. And we returned everyone safely home during the afternoon. Uh, in the midst of that rain though, VIA also provided support for emergency evacuations, transporting citizens to local shelters. We brought on extra supervisory staff, hourly staff, support staff to assist with all of this. I'd like to particularly point out bus supervisor Charles Bruin. Charles, you're here, right? There we are. Uh, while on patrol and assisting bus passengers, he saw a woman carrying a small child as she was leaving her, her vehicle that was in high water. Uh, he drove into the water, got the, the woman and child into his truck safely as the current actually carried that vehicle into the side of, uh, in the side of his vehicle. So thank you, Charles, for representing us all well. But I do want to acknowledge uh, all the efforts of the entire VIA team in responding to this extraordinary day. Michael Ledesma, Michael is here. He represents, Michael, there we go. He represents us, uh, he represents us at the Emergency Operations Center, so he was there a very long time. Keith Hom manned bus dispatch, but we still managed. Uh, Priscilla Engel was our link to the media. And so I just like everyone here to recognize all the folks at VIA that left the safety of their home on that day to, to uh, protect the safety of those in our community. Amen. Thank you. Amen. Uh, we were also notified over the last few weeks of two, honor, uh, two honors awarded VIA. Uh, VIA's wellness program was awarded silver recognition by the San Antonio Business Group on Health in collaboration with the Mayor's uh, Fitness Council. So congratulations to our wellness coordinator, Justin Kruger. Justin's here. 
Now, Justin has set even a higher goal for himself next year, which is to help me lose 20 pounds. Should he achieve that, I'm sure you'll get the gold next year. Excellent. Uh, we've also been notified that the Institute of Transportation Engineers, ITE, has awarded VIA their 2013 Transportation Achievement Award for Operation for our VIA Primo service. And we will receive that award from ITE at their national conference in Boston in early August. And that's my What report. does that mean, Jeff? Uh, I'm sorry. What does that mean? I mean, tell me about that. It's a that. national competition uh, that uh, folks submit submit applications for the award and they receive those, judge them and determine that our VIA Primo service was, uh, was the transportation achievement for the year in the area of operations, which means in the delivery of a product and then delivery of the service related to the customers. Great. Is that it? That's it. Thank okay. you. Thank you to all the, on behalf of the Board of Trustees, thank you to the VIA community for everything that you do. Um, particularly on a day like Saturday, which just brings into focus your contributions and your sacrifice on behalf of the citizens of our community on a daily basis. But on behalf of all of us up here on the dais, we just want to say how much we appreciate those contributions and the contributions that you make every day. I see some uh, Spurs jerseys in in the audience, so let me also congratulate my vice chairman, uh, the Spurs are also heroes in the same way that VIA and its employees are everyday heroes, so congratulations to you as well. Uh, Mr. Arndt, your report, item number three. Uh, I just gave my report in the midst of all that. That was your report? Yes, okay. That brings us to item number four, which is citizens to be heard. Mr. Chairman, we have six citizens to be heard tonight. The citizens will have three minutes each to speak before the board. You can come up to the front if you'd like to speak, or if you'd rather stay where you're sitting, just raise your hand as your name is called, and the microphone will be brought to you. Damon Mason. Okay. Citations via trustees. It is I, it is I Damon Mason. Um, tonight, I, w I wish to, um, I, I send a, uh, a customer, con uh, a customer concern to to uh, to Mr. Dominguez, Mr. Pashnik, uh Tracy, Mr. Hom, and of course, and along with uh, you know two of your representatives from the customer service department. Um, and okay, and I of course, and I have of course, and I have some uh, vi visual aids here along along with it, so that uh, you know that should have been uh, distributed out to you. Um, the first thing that it, that it go that it goes over is yeah, is it yeah you know, it it. It, it deals with the Saturday's rainstorm, and um, and and I wish to point out a flaw with the with the north with the northbound uh, you know uh, Primo with, with its with its uh, with its uh, reliance on the lower level lower level of I-10. I that is not that is not a good that is not a good idea. I I would like I would like for you to um, you know to to run that coach on the up, on the upper level I-10, and. Um, and uh, avail egress 567A to revert to reverse course at Fulton before for doubling back to, to Fredericksburg Road. Also, the the uh, the routing of the the the, uh, the clockwise looper, yeah, it's current it's current routing to uh, you know, from Crossroads Parkway to Truedale Drive uh, is is uh, um, is um, is um, is as is is, thir is thirteen tenths of a mile, and take and and a and and take and takes four minutes. Now I I I ran that through the Google Map and I and I found a, I found a a a routing pattern that's eleven tenths of a mile but only takes two minutes. You you should you should really you should really give you should really give some thought toward um uh you know embracing that. The the um the the um. The Route 14 coach needs to, uh, you know, to uh, to service to service Randolph to uh, service Rand Randolph Parker ride, in, in, to uh, to help to help like to help like you know reduce the reduce the the over overcrowding, and um, of course and I have and of course and I have a um, you know right uh, you know route riding for that for that. So, so anyway, so anyway, yeah, I've the, these these visual aids that, that I have that I have here, I've I've I fought with Google Maps 
for hours to, you know, in order to, in order to get, in order to get this, in order to get this just right. So, so, you know, so the least you could do is to, is to, is to please, is to please make you, is to please make use of it. So, say, so anyway, so anyway, enjoy yourselves. Margaret Rice. Board of Directors, my concern is about the Primo. The Primo does not stop close enough to Vance Jackson and Fredericksburg Road for the, for the patrons that used to ride the 91-92 that stopped right there at Vance Jackson and Fredericksburg Road. There's a bunch of handicapped people that ride the, that rode those two buses that, um, that's, that live in those Fredericksburg apartments and, and go to the Goodwill right there. And there's not a bus, there, the 520 does not go downtown and the Primo does. And then you have to walk to, from Bab, either to Babcock and there are handicapped people like me who cannot walk from Fredericksburg, from the Fredericksburg Place apartments all the way to Babcock or back to Duchantel. And Fredericksburg, that is too far for handicapped people to walk. And there needs to be a bus that goes downtown. We would have to walk it from those Fredericksburg apartments all the way across to the word the Walgreens, and that for handicapped people, that is too far to walk. We need a bus stop that goes downtown closer, so that I. People can go to downtown to go to church or other activities downtown without having to take three buses to go to their church or other activities. Because I would have, to, if I was to go to church from my from my apartment, I would have to catch three buses: two to go downtown, one to transfer to go back to my church on McCullough and Broadway, and that for me is too too inconvenience. I, otherwise, I would have to take the Bay of Trans, and that's, you know, sometimes I can't get the times I need. And if I want to catch, then I would have to catch a bus, I would have to walk, and so that's inconvenience. Y'all are inconvenienced citizens. Handicapped citizens. That's all I have to say, trustees. Larry Johnson. Thirty-five years ago, Via Metropolitan Transit came into being. Thirty-five years ago, Mono Ginobili was just one year old. <laughs> I was a few years older than that. Bill Martin was older than I was still. 1978, <laughs> Via took over from Goodwill Industries with one dozen vans. The general manager at that time was a man by the name of Wayne Cook, who uh, when he was um, asked about providing accessible bus service for persons with disabilities, answered, over my dead body. And so it has come to pass over his dead body. <laughs> Many changes have happened over the years, some good and some not so good. We went from, uh, VIA went from serving uh, passengers uh, one and a half miles service area to three quarters of a mile service area along bus routes. In, mid, in the mid 1990s, I met with one senior VIA manager who told me that VIA's philosophy is to provide the least amount of service to the least number of people at the least possible cost. It reminds me of when I was growing up, <coughs> we were given two choices uh, uh, for supper. It was take it or leave it. Fast forward to 2013. We've come a long way. We now have uh, 225 vans serving 
13,000 persons with disabilities. We have operators who have received special sensitivity training. We have better vehicles, telephone notification system, more reasonable door-to-door -door and no-show policies. Workshops that allow for input from passengers. A better will call procedure. Promised changes to the recertification policy. An anticipated same day request service. And most important of all, the opportunity for open dialogue with the CEO and senior management. Also, a board that is genuinely interested in and responsive to the needs and concerns of passengers with disabilities. And so I thank you. And my hope is that this type of present open communication will continue and that it will be uppermost in your minds as a board when you consider and deliberate on the selection of the new permanent president and CEO of VIA. Mark Kelman. Good evening. My name is uh, Mark Kelman. I'm an architect. The happened to be in on the start of the Hemisphere Park uh, um, master plan. They were, they were holding public uh, design charrettes where the, you're asked to solve design or put design issues on the paper in a very short time. So I was a, a, a leader of a team at one of the tables and they had supplied us, the consultants had supplied us with blocks to place on a map on, on Hemisphere Park. Now, from this exercise, it was about three or four hours that our, my team had come up with a increased density along Cesar Chavez Avenue. Essentially, this was by count and by the, the way that this design shred was set up, we, we ended up with a population along Cesar Chavez approximately 700 people. The streetcar had a, a design charrette a little bit later, six months within a year or so. So I showed up at that one with preloaded with my Hemisphere Park experience. They had started to predict the uh, rail car going straight through Hemisphere Park. And I was still very open-minded about this. Uh, um, but the one, it hasn't gone away. And what I'm trying to demonstrate here uh, with a little bit of math is that there might be a better solution than going straight through Hemisphere Park. The route, all six routes, um, route alternates that were presented in the last VIA meeting, uh, as far as pre presenting the routes, show going through Hemisphere Park. The only problem is that it is very difficult to support the amount of density required to have a streetcar for that long. Along the northern boundary of the convention center and Hemisphere Park, there are, uh, um, there's a, on the east side, there's a high-rise, uh, then the hotel, then the mall, then an, uh, another hotel. There's several thousand people immediately in one block before you hit Alamo Plaza. To repeat that on Cesar, Cesar Chavez in the city of San Antonio would take more than the 700 people that we were able to design into the scheme right off the top. So I've listed there in the letter that there's two more examples. In San Francisco, the buildings settled out at about eight stories high apiece, so that would be more people. In Sao Paulo, Brazil, where the density is very high, it's one of the world's largest cities, the, there are blocks and square miles where the buildings are up to 30-story towers all the time. So that's very, very high density. To repeat that in San Antonio just doesn't quite fit when I say it. So you have between 700 people and 2,400 people as, an, as a good number for the number of people that would be along Cesar Chavez, whereas immediately you have double that on the northern boundary. That was my point, and it, it's substantiated just a bit in the letter. Thank you very much.
Willie Mae Clay. Good evening. First of all, I want to give accolades to uh, the VIA board for considering uh, the need to have the citizens to be heard portion a little earlier. Um, I did get some feedback from one of the participants here. I told him to speak to the fact that you wanted some feedback from the public as to how uh, the change in the citizens to be heard portion is affecting individuals or how it's, it's making a, an impact on the, on the meeting. So you will be hearing something. Uh, but I do thank you for making that move. Um, I'm Willie Mae Clay. I didn't even introduce myself. I guess because I feel so comfortable and so at home. Uh, you know I don't come here to visit unless I have something important to say. I'm not as articulate as my friend Larry Johnson, but we've known each other for a long time. Larry, thank you for, for the history and uh, the accolades that you've given to the body because we've seen a lot of things happen over 20 years, haven't we, Larry? All right, brother. I'm here to talk about one, one of the things that Larry mentioned, the call notification system. I've seen a lot of things acquired by VIA over the years, last 20 years, since I've been using paratransit. It's one thing to have it, and it's another thing to use it. And so I'm letting you know for the past month or so, the notification system you've had, but it hasn't been utilized or working effectively. It was my understanding that that was an element that was going to be acquired to enhance the, the, um, the well, to do away with possibly minimize the no-shows that you have. Uh, we knew that the cab had that component, and we knew that VIA was going to get it, and it was wonderful when it was acquired. But let me tell you from a personal experience, it helps me tremendously to have that notification system. It helps me when the call, the ADL system occurs the night before if you have a scheduled trip, the next day, it helps me when the, when the call occurs, letting me know the van's on the way. What I detest more than anything would be an excuse when the system isn't working or isn't being used. The excuse that is given to the riders is that, if an incident occurs, is that that's just the courtesy we have. Well, I say to VIA, it's, curty, it's necessary that, the, that the, ri the drivers and the riders be courteous to each other. But it's a necessity that anything you purchase, especially with taxpayer dollars, that it be used the way it's intended to be used. And let's not make excuses. Thank you for your time. Ferris Hodge. Go, Spurs, go. Go, Spurs, go. And I can dance with y'all, believe it or not. <laughs> well, y'all loosen up a little bit. You know, I, I just like to have fun. Uh, the Spurs did good. This is my 1999 hat. And I had to pull it out of the, uh, where we keep it at to let y'all know that I've been a Spurs fan all my life. Uh, Genovi, Parker, and Tim are tops. And also, they bring in the young men and, and show them how to do it the right way. And I want to say to the Lakers, goodbye, Lakers. Y'all are no longer the top team in the nation. Now, as far as VIA letting the people know when, the, when that VIA trans get there, they was notifying the people ahead of time, but it's not every time VIA come. So we went outside, and the lady was waiting there five minutes, and she said, uh, we said that VIA didn't notify uh, 
or a stick up van can. And she said, well, they have a problem with it. Sometimes you'll, you'll, uh, you'll, uh, on the inside of the buses, it don't give you the time and the date and stuff like that. Here lately, they've said, route nine, route number 88, route number 88, just keep repeating the same thing over and over about 10 or 15 times. So y'all system is outdated, what I what you want to say. Now, uh, y'all been starting a meeting at 5 o'clock, which is good. But as far as for citizens to be heard, it ought to be about 5.15. Because we're, we're transferring different buses. And, you know, the bus is not running every 15 or 20 minutes like on number 4 or whatnot. I had to get off the bus at Cyprus and walk real fast to get over here. Because by the time you get through with security, you know, it's another 10 minutes after. Uh, a month ago, the guy didn't have the full fare. He was short $20. So the lady said, uh, she was already 25 minutes late. She said, I'm going to call the, the, the VIA police. I said, you are not going to call the VIA police. How much he owe you? 20 cents. I put the 20 cents in. And I said, these buses, the only time these buses stop is when there's a fight on the bus. That's the only time these buses stop. You keep rolling until VIA catch up with you. Because we already was 25 minutes going to work. The, the police get paid. The dispatcher get paid. The bus driver, they get paid. And then, you know, we can lose a whole day's pay, uh, one hour. So y'all cannot stop the buses because somebody didn't pay the full fare. A lot of times put, people put in extra money on those buses. I mean, every day, maybe $500 worth, maybe more than that, maybe less than that. So y'all cannot stop these buses. And I always have a little extra chain in case some of the bus driver kind of go kind of crazy and they want to call the VIA police. No, you ain't calling no police unless they fight you are not going to stop the bus. Uh, the Primo bus is packed. And the lady was telling y'all a few minutes ago that it, it, the stops are too far in between. And somebody said, y'all going to come up with another route called 95. Y'all should, should keep 94 route. The bus should go down the Vero Street and go out the, the regular route uh, down uh, Fredericksburg Road. Y'all need to make that stop at the Primo stop, the regular stop. Cause we get off the, and the 520 bus is always late because of the, of the railroad track. Two or three buses in the back of each other. So that's what y'all need to do. And then the last thing, uh, the maps are outdated on the, the bus shelter. You got one bus shelter that they put on Commerce in Navarro. Uh, when it rains, the rain come down on us. So y'all need to have some kind of backside to keep the rain from, from coming on us, getting us wet. And uh, I think that uh, Saturday was a disaster. I can't blame y'all. I didn't know the buses had stopped. I usually listen to the radio. I was soaking red. I had my boots on. I water all in my boots and everything. So y'all did what y'all could. It wasn't the best thing that y'all did, but I'm glad y'all did stop the buses because uh, somebody else could have went, went in the ditch. And the last thing I want to say, I know he's walking up on me. Go, Spurs, go! Go, Spurs, go! <laughs> y'all have a good day. If y'all see somebody running down the street screaming and hollering, don't call 911. It's just me. Go, Spurs, go. Y'all have a good day. Mr. Chairman, there are no more citizens to be heard. Thank you. <laughs> Item number five, our consent agenda. Do I have a motion for approval? Mr. Chairman, I request that we pool items I and J for additional information. Okay. Do I have a motion to approve so the consent moved. agenda uh, as amended? So moved. I have a motion by Mr. Miller and a second by... Dr. Gambetta, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Motion passes. Item I for individual consideration. Who's going to address that? OK, Mr. Buchanan. Item I is a contract modification <coughs> um, that is needed as a result of finding unknown utilities and unknown surface conditions as part of the Buena Vista reconstruction project right there, Buena Vista and Commerce, right as part of the Primo project. Um, we, we have found several underground utilities, an underground foundation, and a lot of different things that needed to be moved as a result of the construction that efforts there, and we're requesting a $350,000 increase in the contingency. Any discussion? The $300,000 modification is for engineering or construction contract it is to pay the contractor mr. Okay. chairman quick question will this keep us still under budget 
the Primo project remains under budget, both with the changes resulting from this item and from the next item, item J. Thank you. Do I have a motion to approve item I? So moved. I have a motion by Mr. Miller and a second by Mrs. Bersenio. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Motion passes item number J. Item J is additional compensation to the contractor associated with the inline stations. Um, we had a hard deadline associated with the opening of Primo. In early November, we directed the contractor to work overtime in order to meet that goal and not have to extend the opening date or push the opening date. So the contractor did um, uh, appease our request and put extra workers out there um, to construct the project. And as a result, we um, are asking for approximately $122,000 to pay the contractor overtime. And once again, the project did open on time and under budget. The So it's not really acceleration. This is... Well, it's basically it's just it a hard deadline. You had to ask people to work overtime. Exactly. We asked people to work overtime in order to meet the hard deadline. Chairman. With these two, co these two modifications to contracts associated with Primo, approximately how much under budget do you remain? Around $2 million, Mr. Chairman. Great. Thank you. Move do I have a motion? I have a motion by Mr. Miller. Do I have a second? Second. I have a second by Mrs. Bersenio. All in favor? Aye. Motion passes. Thank you. Okay. Item six, Mr. Smith, transit funding matters in the city of New Braunfels. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and, and board. Uh, this item is to provide a briefing um, on a request presented by the uh, city of New Braunfels um, to VIA to support the allocation of funds for their transit services as they're now in the urbanized area uh, of San Antonio. Uh, we've been uh, in discussions or beginning discussions with uh, ACOG and the City of New Braunfels and today representing uh, the City of New Braunfels actually has a uh, council meeting going on at the same time and Gary Ford, the transportation engineer with the City of New Braunfels is here in the audience along with uh, Bill Mosley uh, with ACOG. We've asked um, Linda Charrington with the uh, Texas Transportation Institute to come and provide a presentation uh, to the board um, for kind of an understanding of the transportation, uh, public transportation funds. Good evening. <coughs> My name is Linda Charrington and I'm with Texas A&M Transportation Institute. For several years, uh, TTI has been following first the projected population changes as a result of 2010 and then the actual impacts on urban and rural areas in the state. And with passage of MAP 21, our research extended to looking at the impacts of the changes in urbanized area that affect funding. Um, I'd like to today at the invitation of the VS staff uh, ACOG and the City of New Braunfels present a summary of how the census uh, has changed and affected particularly Guadalupe and Comal counties and the City of New Braunfels. Talk a little bit about how that affects transit funding and uh, look at current service in, in the urbanized area in those two counties. Um, thank you. The map that you uh, see illustrated now is a map of the San Antonio urbanized area. The orange area is the urbanized area as of 2000 census, and the green area is the area that expanded and became uh, additional urbanized area. You'll see that most of the growth of that urbanized area is within Bear County. The growth in Bear County was about 25 percent, but there is additional growth into Comal and Guadalupe counties and by the new census 2010 urbanized area criteria the city of new braunfels uh, was brought into the the uza for san antonio now what is that impact the decennial census is the basis for defining how urbanized and non-urbanized or rural areas are defined for purposes of federal transit funds and funds are apportioned specifically by the urbanized area and the rural area definitions there's another important factor that in Texas, the urbanized area also defines eligibility for state transit funding. State transit funding is not available in the San Antonio urbanized area 
uh, as it is not available in most large metropolitan areas in the state which have transit authorities funded by a local sales tax. The other uh, significant impact of a rural or urban area is the flow of funding. This illustration shows that rural areas and small urban areas receive their funding from the Federal Transit Administration through the state DOT or TxDOT in Texas. But urbanized areas receive their funding, uh, large urbanized areas through the designated recipient, which in San Antonio, of course, is VIA. This is an illustration of what is now the San Antonio urbanized area, including all of the jurisdiction. If you overlay the VIA service area onto that urbanized area, it becomes a very visual, good visual of which areas are now outside the VIA service area, but within urbanized San Antonio. And the source of funding for any transit services in those areas, if provided, must come through the UZA. Now, current transit services in New Braunfels and Guadalupe and Colmile counties are provided by the Alamo Area Council of Governments through their transit service, Alamo Regional Transit, or ART. The service area for ACOG is an 11 county rural transit district that surrounds Bear County, and it includes Guadalupe and Colmile counties. Transit is provided in that 11 county area by uh, the ACOG Rural Transit District, which receives its funds through the state from federal FTA rural funds and from the TxDOT state funds. Now, TxDOT did extend funding authorization for the newly urbanized areas in Comal and Guadalupe counties through August of 2013, but that extension of the funding will expire in August uh, just three months from now. This is an illustration of the Alamo Area Council of Government Service Area for Art. Uh, you'll see that it surrounds Bear County and the San Antonio urbanized area. I also wanted to illustrate this because in a moment I will uh, provide some information to share with you that any transit service, any revenue miles that are operated in that 11 county area actually contribute funding to the VIA uh, uh, funding through 5307 for the urbanized area and I'll come back to highlight that. Right now, the transit services that are provided in Guadalupe Comal County are highlighted here. Uh, it, the uh, utilization of the service is uh, about 25,000 riders in the county annually. And of that, about 65% are now in the urbanized area. And of that, about 90% is in specifically New Braunfels and the surrounding urbanized area. We've also given an indication of the revenue miles in this service area and the revenue hours. The cost of operating in vehicle capitalization, and, and about 35 cents per revenue mile, and uh, the cost of operations is about $62.50. Uh, in the urbanized area is about $554,000, $555,000. A little profile for the transit users in New Braunfels and the surrounding area. Uh, if you'll notice on the left, the transit riders are about 36% uh, are over age 60 in New Braunfels, and in Cibolo shirts, about 74% are over 60. On the right are the transit trip purpose. Uh, about 27% of all trips serve medical purposes, and this is not Medicaid transportation. This is other medical. Another 27% school trips and 26% for nutrition services. There are a total of, um, as I mentioned earlier, about 15,000 15, annual trips in New Braunfels. Now the impact of transit funding in this area, ART will not be able to continue to use rural transit funds to provide service in the urbanized area after August of 2013. If transit continues in this area, to provide the funding for the services I just outlined, it must come from federal and local sources of revenue. These federal sources are 5307, 5339, and 5310. It requires agreement with the MPO and the designated recipient VIA to use these funds. Uh, these areas is not, are not eligible for state transit funds to provide any sort of local match. Now, you're all, I think, probably very familiar with the urban formula funding programs. 
I've highlighted here some particular characteristics. The 5307 program is intended to be used for capital and it can be used for maintenance. The 5339 program is a new program for bus and bus facilities. It can be used 80% federal for those capital investments. And the 5310 elderly and disabled program for the first time is being uh, assigned to the urbanized area for allocation via is the designated recipient. And those funds may be used up to 45% for operating and at least 55% must be used for capital. Uh, purchase of a service does qualify as a capital investment. The 5310 program also requires a regionally coordinated plan which is currently filed by ACOG uh, for the, the uh, region. This is an indication of the funding that is now awarded to the San Antonio urbanized area. The uh, Federal Transit Administration announced the full 2013 financial awards about two weeks ago and uh, the San Antonio UZA receives $32.8 million which is divided uh, uh, by the three programs as indicated. I've also indicated the factors by which monies are awarded and I wanted to highlight those because the characteristics of the urbanized area beyond the VIA service area also contribute in uh, the categories of population and density, population growth, uh, in low income population, population 65 and over, population with disabilities, the, the, uh, the population in Comal and Guadalupe County in the urbanized area contribute. In addition, the vehicle revenue miles that are operated by ACOG for the ART Rural Transit System, interestingly enough, under Map 21, also contribute to, fundings to funding to the urbanized area. This table uh, allocates those funds. The total apportionment is in the total for UZA column, the second from the left. The, gen the uh, funds generated by the population in Guadalupe and Comal counties is the middle column and it represents about 832,000 total dollars amongst those three categories or about 2.5 percent of the total San Antonio UZA allocation. The funds generated by the ART revenue miles in the rural area, uh, there are 1,459,700 in 2011 and that generates $678,000 that are contributed to the San Antonio UZA. In total, Guadalupe and Comal County with the ART revenue miles contribute about 4.6 percent of the total UZA funding. Now I have highlighted a few options that might be available for allocation of funds to the uh, to ACOG and or the city county for service in New Braunfels and Guadalupe Comal County. Uh, I'm just going to flip through those fairly quickly because that may be discussion you might you might wish to have with staff. Uh, but we wanted to highlight, if we could please, the next steps. Uh, those next steps would be to discuss with VIA the options that might be available to New Braunfels and the rest of the uh, Guadalupe Comal counties, to evaluate possible eligibility for capital operating funds under 5307 or 5310. An important step is to identify local share contributions that must be used to match any source of federal money and then negotiate agreements to be able to continue transit service. I wanted to close just by highlighting the fact that public transit service uh, for the general public in, in the Guadalupe Comal area, in the urbanized area, will terminate as of August 31 if there is not another source of federal and local funds uh, identified. I'd be happy to answer any questions, questions that you might, you might have. have. I have a lot of questions. Okay. okay. Mary, do you, Ms. Bersenia, you want to start? I've got a lot of questions. Okay. okay. You, you go ahead with your questions. Okay. I mean, it, the purpose of having this presentation is to begin to understand what the financial implications of the expansion of the MPO boundary are, because is that, is that basically what we're attempting to do well, Quite today? frankly, this is not directly related to the MPO boundary. Funding from transit mm -hmm. is allocated to the urbanized area. And if you had one MPO in Bear County or two MPOs or, or one MPO that expanded, the funding for transit But what is triggering this change. is that we now have to accept responsibility for New Braunfels specifically. And that's because that of the UZA boundary and your position as designated okay. recipient. That's correct. Okay. Right. 
And then I'm, so now I have to understand, because I'm, you've thrown a lot of numbers out. Yes, sir. Today. Can you go back? Yes. Which, which table? Well, I, I have a, but like, here's some of my questions. Is 5339 and 5310 are new sources of money that have not been available, um, I'll use your term, in the UZA before? The 5339 is a new funding source under MAP 21. In the past, funds were available under a program called 5309, and they were designated as, as, um, as discretionary funds. And transit systems around the country would pursue funding under 5309 by the qualification of their project and their ability to persuade funding, uh, the FTA and But others. now this is just flowing down to, by to formula. VIA. By formula. By formula yes, to VIA. So this is new money to VIA. And it typically this new money would be used for discrete projects that serve this community. These communities, th yeah. this community being over 65 and people with disabilities. And I wanted to point out, I have an error on the table. 5339, are you referring to? Yeah, 5339. 5339 is not, 5310 is the elderly. No, disabled. it says 5339. And okay, I, so. I, I want to okay. explain, I have an error on the chart. Second if you would look there. under the formula funding factors, and I apologize that I did not catch this. If you would look at the middle, the population and density, vehicle revenue miles and passenger miles are appropriately listed with 5339. I apologize for that. And population 65 and over and people with disabilities belongs with 5310. Yeah, I needed to off. swap those two. Okay, so. But, but back to your point, 5339 is a program to fund buses and bus facilities. It's a capital program. Okay. I'm pretty good, but you all have me confused today. Um, okay. So 5307 is what we historically have received. 5339 is now a formula allocation for capital that used to be discretionary in another program. 5310 is a program that has existed, as his, has existed historically, but for the first time is being sent directly to VIA as opposed to the f funds that VIA could pursue through a different could, organization that administers. Could you go to slide 13? I know we're looking at the numbers, but they give the, the definitions there, which help me. Yeah, the, if you go to, can Thank you go you. back to the, right, can you go back to the one you were at 14? No. This one? Yes. This one? <laughs> yes. There you go. Okay. That's it. Okay, so help me understand, I don't understand what this chart means exactly. Okay. Is the cost, is this cost or is this is this, this is funding, funding generated, generated generated by the factors okay that the formula that's what that uh -huh. should be what out of the 32 million dollars or so that we're going to get in this fiscal year if you were looking at what is generated by the population that we're now responsible for this is the amount of money that we would by some formula take out of that 32 million but the decision how you use it is indeed the designated recipient through the planning process. However, what this shows is these are the dollars that are literally generated by the right. math in the formula. And what is not showing here is that there's been, there has in the past been some matching, right? And now a, a community like New Braunfels isn't going to, they don't, they're not getting matching funds. In, in the past, transit in New Braunfels has been funded through ACOG from rural funds from the Fed mm -hmm. and from state funds from Texas. So and even the state e funds match in it. this new equation, when you get whatever allocation we decide as the board yes, sir. to pass along to Guadalupe and Comal County, there is still that that commun those communities have to deal with the lack of matching funds that used to flow through TxDOT and no longer flows through That's TxDOT. Correct. And there's no agreement yet about well we don't have we we don't have a p process or a formula in place by which we're going to decide how this g gets done. There are a number of sources of funds that can be used as local match, mm -hmm. uh, including local general revenue dollars, uh, mm -hmm. local dollars generated through community development block grants, local dollars generated through. Uh, sales Do tax those flow on a time frame that will meet their, uh, and I know you don't, 
you're not New Comal County or Guadalupe County, That's but right. are those available along a time frame that helps them meet this new structure that goes into place after August 31st? Well, as and it might be best that someone else speaks for that, yeah. but I think that's one of the reasons for wanting to know now what might be possible through federal funds. Yes, Mr. Chairman, to answer your question, uh, uh, we've been having weekly discussions with the uh, City of New Braunfels um, uh, and ACOG, and, and that was the, the discussion we had specifically last week was what is the source of funds that the City of New Braunfels will need to bring forward in matching these funds and so they're taking that back to their city manager and their council uh, for discussion um, uh, and to look at where those funds w will come from they they want to participate and uh, their current budget doesn't have that in it but they are desiring to put it in their budget uh, for this coming year what did they receive by allocation from the, uh, what would be helpful for me to understand that I don't think is in here, maybe it was and I just missed it, in 2012, right? If yes, you sir. looked at what they were allocated as a rural entity, as a rural then a, and then the whatever matching funds, would that equate to the $832,000? No, sir, it would equate to um, the number in the far right, the 554000 That's the cost which includes uh, both federal and state funds that were used to support transit services in 2012 in this area. Okay, and so let me go back to you, Clay. In the conversations with Guadalupe and Comal County or New, New Braunfels, Braunfels, New Braunfels. Yeah, city of New Braunfels, has the conversation been around a cost of about $554,000? Yes, we've we've been looking around 554, right around that 500 thousand dollar range, and that's what they would need to be looking at matching, 50 uh, percent to bring those funds, um, bring get those matching funds, and so uh, that's currently what they're going back. They'd have to still with. match the 554. Half of it. Half, Half of, of it. it. Half they'd of have it. to match. They'd have to find a quarter, 250 thousand dollars or so. That's right. Okay. That, somewhere in that neighborhood. I, I think I'm beginning to understand. Can you go back to the last, that last one we were looking at with the 830 whatever? Back, yeah. And so the, the 32,775,000 represents an increase in funding to the UZA from fiscal year 2012 of how much? I can tell you that the uh, 5339 did not exist, so we don't have a 12 number for that. Yeah. What's the total? Okay. What well, is the difference? Yeah. Just don't tell me formulas. Just give me the, f what's uh, the difference? Oh, is it the difference between? In 2012, the only number available to you was the top 28. row, 5307. And, and Mr. Arndt, what was the San Antonio UZA in 2012? About 25. So this is an increase over 2012 of about 5.3 million total, including the two new formulas of funding that are now coming down by, by, by formula, as opposed to granting. So there's about five million dollars. Five point, how much? 5.2. I'm looking back to the 2012-5307 allocation to San Antonio UZA was, again, please. 25. Uh, 25, okay. roughly. So about so 3 that, million there and, and... And then the others that you see on the, on the screen, yes. So about, that does, you're correct, that adds up to about 8 million, I believe. 8 million increase. Okay. And so now it's, now we're going to get to a point where in this new financial ecology we're living in, we need to allocate or it's, we, we need to find a way to work primarily with New Braunfels to come up with some allocation to them that they used to get a different way and they're going to get this way. And the only piece that's missing for them that we can't resolve for them is that they used to get a match from TxDOT. They're not going to get that match anymore. You got it. And, they're, and what they would have gotten in terms, I think I'm understanding what they would have gotten in terms of both their rural formula, right, that's correct. and their match was approximately 
just b beneath 600,000, about 554. That 554 does include operating in a, in a small allocation, about 50,000 for the capitalization of the fleet. Okay, I understand now, I think. <laughs> I understand the yeah, problem. That's, that's, it. that's it. Okay. If I could add. So you all are gonna go, you're gonna take all of this information and you're gonna go back and keep meeting with the communities, whoever yes. those community representatives, and then you're going to come back to us sometime during the summer, b during our budget process, during June, before during like to do their, the their, their timeline runs out on August 31st, and we're going to have a recommendation about how to maintain their bus service. The way this works is they don't, they're not going to have via bus service. They're going to continue their own bus service but we're going to be the pass-through agency for them as opposed to ACOG in the future. Is that what your discussions have yeah, been? The, the funding would come through through VIA, and one of the choices would be to contract So with, you haven't decided ACOG. how you're going to do it yet? That's okay. correct. Okay. That's Got the it. likely scenario, though. What this does is this would continue their service just like they do today, their, their operating service, so that they can continue to provide service uh, to their citizens that use the system today. There may be more discussions later on, but this kind of gets us to the first base and gets the pro continues their service so no one's standing at the corner waiting. Can I, can I ask one more question about this chart here? Yes, yes, sir. The 678 by re revenue by mile allocation means what in, co means what in combination with the 832? Are they supposed to be combined to get to something? Well, again, this is information mm -hmm. because it is. And look a, at it two it's ways. It's a local decision. It's, this is information to inform you that the population in those two counties generate the 832 by the math, the, literally the math that yeah. you could follow. Or you could look at a revenue mile formula. It's not or, it's and, in addition and, to. And, uh -huh. This far right column is a very interesting uh, result of Map 21, and that is that in large urbanized areas in which a portion of the area is served by a rural transit district, all of the revenue miles of that rural transit district actually generate about 0.54 cents every mile to the funding to the urbanized area. It's a very curious, this isn't just in those two counties. This is art service in 11 counties. That's according to the federal, to the the federal guidelines or the way MAP 21 Formula is supposed to guide your, your yes, thinking sir. for a local decision. So am I supposed to be looking, look, just to be clear, right, am I supposed to be looking at about uh, 1.4 to 1.5 million? It's about 1.5 is generated by either the population in Guadalupe Gomal, Gomal County and the revenue miles operated by the rural transit district in 11 counties. In all 11 counties. So that's in not just 11. the portion that's operating in that's their correct. area. Okay. That's and then let me ask you another question. You're saying they w they're considering participating. I don't understand what that means. That this is where they're going to get their funding. Right. Well, I think the consideration is finding the local match and looking at what those opportunities are from city revenues and or uh, other, other communities in the UZA. And also, there are any non-U.S. DOT source of federal funding that is eligible for transportation can be used as local match. So you can look at other programs. Like what? Uh, CDBG is a good example. Got it. Um, another is medical transportation through the Medicaid program. Mm -hmm. Those are all funds that are generated and can be used as match. So even if let's say that they get, you know, CDBG funding, they can use that to help match and draw down the five whatever the federal whatever funds, that is whatever okay. the portion of the five. Even though it's not literally a transport flowing to a tr through That's a correct. transportation revenue stream. That's correct. Okay, I got it. So they just have to look and see and what they already have go getting, you know, making its way to that community that in some way is works Is eligible to be used for federal uh, okay. match. That's correct. Okay. I understand. Can I ask Linda one question? <laughs> sure. <laughs> Linda, go ahead. Linda, could, could you tell me, uh, generated by art revenue miles, if I was on, only going to look at the Guadalcomal 
urbanized area? How much? How many dollars are generated by the service only in that area? Yeah, but the revenue out. miles in that area are um, 137,300. Okay. And so if you took a look at those and multiplied, short number is by 0.54, uh, under 5307. And then there is another small allocation under 5339 that okay. those dollars generate. I can generate figure that out then. Okay. Thanks. I, I understand the UZA. What I don't understand too, that's a very good question. What I don't understand is we're primarily talking about the city of New Braunfels, but are we also talking about uh, transit coverage beyond? Uh, what do we have to address between now and August 31st? Only New Braunfels, or do we have to address transit needs throughout Comal and Guadalupe County? Now the, the initial need is, is just in New Braunfels. Okay. That's the initial service. So it's some portion of what we're looking at by formula, I understand. If I could show you the, the map, um, and so if you can see New Braunfels, you, you'll notice that leg that goes down toward Seguin. Mm -hmm. that's, that's New Braunfels and extends beyond their city limits, but that's all UZA. And then the red that then approaches the Bear County line, that's Shirts, Cibolo, and Garden Ridge. And they're proposing to be, a, you all are meeting with them as well? well there, there is an interest in, the, in that area. because They have a relatively small demand as compared to New Braunfels. I want to emphasize that. It's, it's relatively small. But, but from the perspective of the current users, um, there are about 1,100 trips in that area annually. And I think from ACOG's perspective, they would like to not deny transit service to those areas as well. So that's why that additional conversation might go on. But it is a much smaller piece of the demand. Are we talking to them as part of my point? I have not at this okay. time, but, but, we, but we can. But, but we're hearing that we ought to. Okay. All right. In the interest of continuing service to a, a population that is of need. Yes. I understand. Question. Mr. What, Miller. What service area does the ART deliver to? Uh, art service area is all 11 counties. Non-urbanized. Non, no, all 11 counties, and right now they serve all of Guadalupe and Comal. As of Aug at the August 31st, then they could not serve the area in red that with using rural transit funds. They must find another source of funding. So is the service connected? Is, is New Braunfels uh, connected to civil low insurance? Yeah. Th that's a good question. All of the service is currently demand response. And so trips are provided to individuals that schedule their service at least 24 hours in advance, much like your via trans like service. Yeah. And so there is no fixed route or regularly scheduled route. These are individuals who schedule their trips uh, either 24 hours in advance or on a subscription basis. And those are the trips served by ART. The first time that they have ever operated any type of fixed or flexible services in Seguin very recently. There is not currently any fixed service in this area. Thank you. Are those vans right now? Uh, they, they are what is, are, are called, um, they're, small, they're small buses. Uh, and so would you, the way to handle that potential, I'm not trying to, but you are the TTI, so you look at <laughs> benchmarking those, yes. right? Yes. You can look at different methodologies of providing that service. They don't really... They're not going to look to us necessarily to provide it. They're going to look to us to allocate it, and then they choose to either use vans or they could use taxis or however they w want to do it. They're just looking for the allocation. The, the funding to Braunfels, the general discussion is for seamless service delivery, which I think Clay spoke to, would seemingly be the most appropriate thing is to continue the art service because mm -hmm. it's in place, it's familiar to the users. So the funding might flow to New Braunfels to purchase that, or it might flow to ACOG to continue to provide it. I see it. Okay, I got it. They currently have the, the vehicles. Uh, one of the things, just to help clarify too, is today, if, if like with ART, if there's someone in Kerrville that needs transportation into Bear County, they provide that. So they, they, they provide it from the rural area into San Antonio to provide that service. So that, that does occur. It's not just moving people Sorry. in New Braunfels. They'll bring them to San Antonio to provide these, these services that they need. Mrs. Bersenio. 
Uh, I ask for a moment of personal privilege just to thank uh, Linda b to be here today. I have not seen Linda since the 1970s and she actually rescued me during a bus strike. <laughs> she and I rode the bus together and um, we both, our destinations were downtown for our, our own jobs. And um, bus strike happened under the old San Antonio Transit and everybody note there has not been one since. Um, and Linda commandeered a, a motor pool vehicle from the city and uh, knew my desperate situation and contacted me and, and we carpooled. And, and then I went on at her recommendation and, and got a job uh, working in the same area in mass transit. So uh, I wanna thank you for rescuing me in that moment of, of panic. And uh, it made me realize it's really where my passion for this subject got started because in that moment, it made me realize that the decisions that we make around routes, uh, we define people's lives. And, and um, we do that every time we make a decision on how to allocate our resources. And so it's great to see that you're still in this industry. And I didn't know you were until, until I ran into Jeff, who y'all have a similar history. So thank you very uh, much. So thank you. And thank you for that, that very good explanation. I think it, it helps us tremendously understand what we need to do. Thank you. And you got a zero dollar a year job in mass transit. Yeah, yeah now I'm a volunteer. <laughs> Anyone else? I know that's uh, Henry, uh, yeah, Mr. Dr. Chair. Gambetta. If I could ask one, as long as we have TTI and, and, and Ms. Harrington's uh, expertise here, uh, I wanted to ask, you, you mentioned sort of the leg on, to Seguin, and Seguin does now run, if, as I understand it, a bus service uh, as opposed to New Brownfields. And that's in combination with ACOG funding, is that correct? Because Seguin is still, as indicated on this map, right. Seguin is still a rural area under the definition of the census 2010, that's right. correct. Right. So that funding is coming through 5311 and uh, state funds. And I would look to Mr. Mosley to know if are the local, local funds contributed as well. Yes, there are local funds. It's a 50-50 match. That's right. 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 Okay. Uh, I guess a couple of, of, of points. Has there been an has TTI or others done an expenditure efficiency or service effectiveness associated with it, with that bus uh, opera, with route, and so on, or is that part of any calculus that? Uh, there is. The, the state funding formula on how the state funds are passed to rural transit districts and how federal 5311 are to rural transit districts include uh, performance and need as criteria. The need is, a, is about 65 percent of the funding and that's defined by the population and the land area. But performance evaluates cost efficiency and cost effectiveness and how much local uh, investments are generated to, to match those federal dollars. So indeed, there is an element of performance that goes into how a rural transit district uh, receives their funding. Right, thank you. And with New Brownfields, there is no sales tax dedicated, or a portion of a sales tax dedicated for transportation. Is that correct, is it? There is not. Uh, the representative from the city is here, but they do have a portion that is an economic development tax. Okay. But there is no portion of their sales tax that is dedicated to transportation. Okay. Thank you. It's been ex exceedingly helpful. Thank you very much. Anyone else? Any questions? Comes back as part of our budget process, I'm sure. You, you might want to just in saying goodbye to you, can you take one minute and explain to the board what the Texas Transportation Institute is because I think it's a, an amazing resource that is nationally known. I'd be very This pleased. is our first interaction with you all formally in the three and a half or so years that I've been here, although I used to deal with you all a lot when I was a TxDOT commissioner. We know Jeff was there, but you might explain for the board's uh, knowledge what TTI yes. is. Yes, uh, Texas A&M Transportation Institute is a research arm of Texas A&M University. Uh, we have about 600 employees. It's about equally divided in, among professional researchers where I would fall. Uh, researchers who also teach and graduate student researchers. Uh, we do national work in all aspects of transportation. Uh, it was originally created in the 1950s to do research for things like asphalt base, or you see the crash barriers, they were designed and tested out of Texas A&M Transportation Institute. But over the years we've developed programs in most modes, and so there are uh, modes in aviation and uh, in ports 
and we have a transit mobility program. Um, I previously worked with, with Jeff Arndt in that program and we all specialize in transit. And in fact, we recently hired a, a former student uh, of, of Dr. Gamita, uh, Lauren Cochran has Hi. just joined our staff and uh, she got her experience in transit originally in California and just joined our staff. So we're all professionals in transit and our background is, is operating and then we applied in the research arm. And so we like to tout transit, thank, but we thank are you for one giving of her many that programs at the <laughs> university. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for that opportunity. Mm -hmm. Item number eight, Dr. Mendoza. Number seven. Oh, sorry, sorry. <laughs> Item number seven, Clay, MPO policy board composition. I wanted to skip over that. I know. <laughs> Well, we're here to um, here to just keep the board briefed on um, the the uh, MPO boundary expansion discussions that have been um, been going on, and uh, I know uh, Dr. Gambetta and and uh, Mr. Lee have been a part of the boundary discussions. And the end of April, the uh, work group um, heard discussions from. Uh, Dr. Gambetta and, and Mr. Lee on on on, on expanding the um, the uh, public transportation role in the MPO. Uh, it uh, uh, as we discussed before, the 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 current board is 19 members with two members from VIA, and uh, the proposal that has come from the work group. Uh, reduces that number down to one. It still maintains the 19 uh, members that we that we have. I know there's been uh, been discussions with uh, uh, with with many on that uh, the number. In fact, even uh, Bear County uh, Commissioner Kevin Wolf uh, uh, has dis has had discussions within the county commissioners, and they. The county was prepared to have it discussed this last uh, commissioner's court, but they d they did not, and so we're anticipating that uh, uh, their next commissioner's court meeting they'll discuss some recommendations from uh, Bear County. And uh, I don't know if uh, Dr. Gambet or Mr. Lee want to add any or or, or Charlie any discussions. It's it's currently ongoing. There hasn't been any. The resolutions have been sent out to each of the, or requests for resolutions to each of the four signatory parties uh, to the continuing phase agreement, and that is the City of San Antonio, Bear County, VIA, and TxDOT. And to date, uh, the city and county have not uh, put it on their agenda yet uh, for signature. If you have any questions. That any questions by the board? Thank you. Item number eight, Gabriel Roeder, Smith and Company Actuarial Valuation, Dr. Mendoza. And while you're up there, you could just do item number nine, which is defined contribution plan contract for record keeping and other related services. Good evening, Mr. Chairman, members of the board. Uh, this evening, uh, we are here to present uh, two actuarial valuations for your review and approval. Uh, staff is here, Orlando Gallego, Manager of Employee Services and Benefits, and we have an invited guest to be able to present this information to you. This is Dan White, Daniel White, who is the Senior Consultant uh, with Gabriel Rotor and Smith Company. As you know, VIA's retirement plan is annually valued by our actuary to determine the financial condition of the plan, and as per your directive during the Executive Committee, uh, when we uh, brought this item for your review and possible approval. We wanted to be able tonight to provide you the plans um, review by the external auditor as well as all the assumptions that we've provided in order for the actuarial evaluations to uh, be done. We will be approving it with your consent two valuations. Uh, the October 1, 2011 valuation and the October 1, 2012 valuation. And with that, staff will stay, but Dan White will be presenting this information to you. Thank you. Members of the board, it's a pleasure to be here. My name is Danny White. I'm with Gabriel Smith. 
Uh, first, let me introduce what the role of an actuary is. So an actuary takes assumptions that are regarding interest, uh, mortality, turnover, retirement, that are all recommended to the board. The board's adopted them. We use those assumptions, map that to actual plan or membership data employees in the plan, both active employees, retirees, and we calculate a cost and liability and map that to compare that to what the actual plan assets are. So with that information is used to develop a funding strategy that management uses to develop a funding policy or such to, uh, to fully fund the plan or attain that goal. And then the second part is there's financial information under the Governmental Accounting Standards Board that goes into the plan's financials. So that's, that's the responsibility of the actuary. Uh, the, uh, uh, what I'm going to present today is the summary of the VAL results for 2011-2012. We perform actuarial valuations every year. The snapshots for San Antonio VA is taken October 1st of each year. This is the plan year. This is when the plan year starts and ends. It also coincides with VIA's fiscal year. The last snapshot was October 1st, 2012. The next one will be October 1st, 2013. And then in addition to the summary information that you're going to be asked to approve, I've got a lot of historical information as well as projection information to show you where you've been, how, do you got, how you got to where you are today, and where you expect it to go in the future. So starting slide, the next slide, slide three, we got a summary of the valuation information, the top parts, the membership information. Other active members, these are em former employees, they've left prior to being eligible to uh, commence a retirement benefit. So these employees may be in their 40s or 50s and not yet retirement age, but they got a benefit due. So once they attain their normal retirement age, they will start their, their retirement benefit. Got payroll. And then we get into the actuarial information. And there's a few terms I want to define. First of all is the normal cost. The normal cost is the value of the benefits being accrued during the year. So benefits are earned based on pay and based on service. So during additional year of service, the employee's benefit goes up. The normal cost is the value today of that benefit. This uh, normal cost component is financed both by employer money and employee money. Employee money is required as condition of employment into the plan. Of that 8.2 8 million, roughly 3.6 is funded by employee money. The difference, 4.6, is funded by the employer. The actuarial accrued liability is the next term. This is the liability attributable benefits that have already been earned under the plan. So for retirees, the benefit's fully accrued. It's what's payable in the future. And then for employees, it's based on the, uh, the benefit attributable service to date. So if you have a 15-year career employee who's only worked 15 years in, it's only that first 15 years of service and then additional future service will pick, be picked up on the normal cost because that's a condition of employment. The next item is the actuarial value of assets. This is a calculated asset value. Um, uh, the, there's a market value which is actually assets in the trust. The calculated asset value is uh, what we call five-year smoothing method in public sector works. It's uh, you take investment gains or losses that are different than assumed and that's recognized proportionally over the next five years. And what the purpose of that is, is that provides predictability and stability in developing the contribution rate. Without it, uh, there'd be increased volatility in the contributions from year to year. The unfunded liabilities, the difference between the, the liability and the calculated value of assets, the funded ratio is the, uh, the ratio of the two. Next, we have the accounting cost. Uh, the, the, and then the employer contributions. What's the typical ratio that you all like to see? Well, it's, it's um, what I would consider 80% or above, but there's another key component to this is it's one thing to have a low funded ratio, but if you have a strong funding strategy that's there to bring you up above it and you've got a policy to bring you to that 100%, uh, you know, that bring, that's less concerning than, say, if I have another plan that uh, is 90% is funded, but they don't have a strong funding policy. They're not even putting enough to sustain the policy. And when you do the projections out that the funded ratio is going to decline, that can also be concerning. So there's actually two parts of it. One of them is the funded ratio. I think above 80% 80, 80 or above provides some margin against adverse experience if you have adverse experience in the investment market. And then of course you've got to need a, f a strong funding policy because I think that ultimate goal 
should be a 100% funded ratio. Um, so that's the terms. 2010 is provided up there because that's been approved by the board. What they're asking today is for 2011, 2012. I want to note one difference, you know, in terms of comparison, to the, the the last two years is 2011, 2012 are based on a different set of assumptions. 2011, GRS recommended a new set of assumptions that had a lower investment return. The investment return assumption was decreased from eight to seven and a half. And then the mortality assumption was strengthened. It assumed people live, uh, retirees live to a later age. So the longer you assume somebody, uh, you know, re is in retirement, then uh, then the more expensive the pension benefit is. I mean, it's the longer it's paid. In addition to the assumption changes, uh, the management uh, modified the funding strategy. You know, you have this funding period. How are we going to fund our finances? Unfunded liability. It's similar to financing a house. You you have a set period you establish by by management. That was 26 years. It was going to be 25 years in 2011. Due to the cost increases that were associated with the assumption changes, they modified the uh, the funding strategy so it was going to be essentially refinanced over a 30-year period, similar to refinancing the house to lower the, the annual payments, and then also to graduate into that that amount with a three-year phase in. So you can see there's a difference between the accounting cost and the employer contribution for 2011-2012 that gap will close um, over the next the next two years all right say that to me again. yeah so the accounting costs take 2011 the accounting costs so this is equivalent to the actuarially determined rate that's 11 and a half million okay and the and the increase from 2010 to 2011 is due primarily to assumption changes but in addition to that there were continued in investment losses that were realized from 2008 can I go back and ask a question about the about the unfunded liability? Absolutely. Which has almost doubled over this period of time. Mm -hmm. Besides the general condition of the market, what are the other um, factors contributing to that for the board to understand? Absolutely. So the unfunded liability, if we look at it for 2012, is 141 million. 28 million was due to the assumption changes that were recommended by GRS. That was in 2011. So that's so the so the increase from 80 million to 124 million, 28 million was due to assumption changes. You know, uh, change in discount rate, improved mortality. There's another um, there's another 20 25 million due to benefit improvements. And this would benefit improvements that were uh, enacted in 2006. That was a change in benefit multiplier. The benefit multiplier increases for those with more than 25 years of service. And then also Say that to me again. Yeah, there was a benefit improvement. So uh, in 2006, uh, prior to 2006, the benefit multiplier was 1.75% times pay times service, regardless of how many years of service you had. So if you had 30 years of service, you take, the, you take the three components, multiply it together, that's your monthly benefit. The plan amendment in 2006 said that after, tw after you attain 25 years of service, that benefit multiplier becomes 2%. And it's based on, your pri on all service. So as soon as, the, as soon as an employee goes from 24 to 25 years of service, the multiplier for determining their monthly benefit increases, it's based on all, all prior service. So there's there's a cliff or an increase in the in the benefit. Question. Could you compare the fine benefit versus the fine contribution? Absolutely. Yeah. So let me explain a defined contribution plan first. That's like a 401k. Uh, so what you do is you have a formula that says um, the company or organization is going to put in X percent of pay. You know, let's call it six percent of pay. Let's say the employees put in another six percent of pay. So every year there's there's in total twelve percent of pay of funds going into an account. It's that person's personal account that they have control over for investments. And with that, the account grows with future contributions each year and with investment earnings. 
And then upon when somebody retires, they take this lump sum cash and then they can, that's, that's their retirement resources. With that and Social Security, that's what they depend on for, for meeting their retirement needs. And it's a defined contribution plan. A defined benefit plan is a, is, an, is a retirement program that provides a monthly benefit. And that monthly benefit is payable for the duration of that retiree's lifetime. They can never outlive that benefit. And, and the, the monthly benefit is determined by a formula. And so let's say we've got a, two per, a person retired with 25 years of service. Uh, you know, you'd take 2% times 25 times whatever their final average salary was. And it's based over a three year averaging period. And you multiply those three factors together, whatever that is, that's your monthly benefit. And that is paid every month to the retiree for the duration of their lifetime. And then there's some options if they want survival, survivor benefits for you know widow benefits. So the difference between the two is when you have a defined contribution plan, the organization knows their costs up front. Their obligation to the retirement benefits is just the annual contribution each year, you know, or each pay period. Once that person leaves the organization, their obligation for funding any retirement benefits is, is gone. I mean, that's the limit of their obligation is just the annual, annual contributions. In terms of defined benefit plan, the organization is responsible for funding that, that benefit. So you made a promise to an employee who's no longer here, he's retired, maybe even been retired 20, 30 years, you still have an obligation to, to provide that benefit. It's a promise. It's a promise for the duration of their lifetime. And so that's where the actuary comes in. You, you've made this monthly promise and the actuary calculates, all right, what's the value of that promise? What's the value of that obligation, that, that liability? And then how are you going to fund or finance this, this promise or liability? And so with that, what's unknown is, is on, the, on, the, on both pieces, what's the investment earnings? You know, that's, that's the most volatile and uncertain part. And with the defined contribution plan, the retirees associated with, or the employees associated with that risk of the investment earnings. It doesn't matter, you know, they could, if they shoot the lights out, great, you know, and, and hit double digit returns, you know, more power to them that they can retire earlier or have more retirement resources. Uh, and the defined benefit plan, it works the same way. But if earnings are less than what you assumed, the organization has to make additional contributions to shore up the funding. The promise is still there, and it doesn't matter what investment earnings are, you have to fund those benefits. So the promise is there on the defined benefit. Absolutely. But the only commitment under the defined contribution would be the matching funds, theirs versus ours. That's exactly right. So what it boils down to is that our retirees would find the defined benefit plan more attractive than they do the defined contribution. The retirees, yes, it's that benefit security. They don't have to manage their plan assets. Uh, they, they know the check is going to be there every month and they're not going to outlive it. And you're saying we got to this point because people are living longer and the interest rates have dropped considerably. So therefore, the promise that we made is not as attractive as it once was, or it's not as stable as it once was for the company. Yeah, and I've got a slide to show you that to, to show you this. We'll get there, so you can actually see the historical part of it. And we also changed the promise. We enhanced the promise. If the as retiree uh, has a, is deceased early, does the benefit then still go to the spouse? And a defined contribution plan? Absolutely, yeah, it's, uh, whatever their account balance is. It's, it's, their, it's the employees or retirees funds. Nobody else has access to it. But my point is if the retiree is decide, dies, then the spouse continues to get the retirement. On a defined benefit plan and the monthly check, they do if they elected a form of payment that provides a spousal benefit. I'm retired and that's the kind of plan that I have and that's mm -hmm. the reason I'm asking the question. They have to make a they have to make a, a cognitive decision to elect a form of payment that has that. So what they do is it's it's a slightly lower monthly benefit, 
but it's got a rider on it you know it's got a expensive relatively more expensive feature so it's cost neutral the plan if they if they choose it you know but since it could be potentially paid out over a longer duration the initial monthly benefit slightly lower yeah i think it's important that the employees understand that that they know they have that option okay okay i i have a question please could you explain to me uh whenever we go to this program what is going to help keep the funds afloat for the defined con the, the defined benefit plan because we explained that defined contribution there is nothing going into uh the defined benefit sure so the question is is if if there was a plan change and now you've got funds for future employees going to defined contribution plan you still have this unfunded liability this 141 million unfunded liability it still has to be paid for there's still a promise for current employees and that promise that needs to be kept and needs to be shored up and made financially secure so the way that happens is in determining the contributions there's two components to it so of that of that 13.6 million dollar actuarially determined rate part of it is for normal costs that's the value of benefits being accrued by the employees each year and what that is is that's 18 point or that 8.2 million dollar total normal cost less employee contributions of of 3.6 million the other part is the financing part that this is the funding strategy developed with management and so management makes the decision how am I going to shore up or how am I going to attain this 100% funded ratio or how am I going to pay down this 141 million dollar liability and so it's amortized very similar to a house it's it's irrespective of of how many members or retirees are going into to to the new plan new employees it's strictly of all right we have 141 million dollars we have the strategy we want to pay it down over 29 years and and you come up with a dollar amount that, that's necessary to do that and that's looked at every year so so we go through evaluation October 1 2013 we look at what the unfunded liability is the funding period will now be 28 years there's going to be new investment gains or losses liability gains or losses that are going to occur and again you true up or readjust what does it take to fully fund to fund this liability over a 28-year period and so that that component right there is what enables the plan to be financially secure after that but it does fall on the rest of management you know management has to make a conscious decision or to to have a, a funding strategy to get to zero you know to fully fund the plan to make the unfunded liability zero okay you mentioned uh 28 years that's what you're looking at is the 28 years what if someone lives beyond the 28 years well the like say they retire at at 50 or 55 and they live another 30 or so years i mean do we come back and renew it after 28 years every year you take a new snapshot and what we're looking for over the the 28 years for next year would be not uh, not at the actual accrued liability but it's the unfunded liability so it's the difference between what's the value of the promise versus what how much do you have in assets to satisfy that promise that's the part you you've got a difference there and it's that difference that you're trying to eliminate and the strategy of management has is we're going to they're going to eliminate that over a 28 year period but absolutely you're you're exactly right that once even if the plan was closed you've got members who are just entering now in their in their 20s and they're going to be paid out through you know possibly 90. now it's a 70 year relationship in terms of having an obligation you've you've earned a benefit by time between its when it's first earned to when it's finally finally paid out and so the plan will will continue to be in existence well be, you know and uh, well beyond the 28 years there's still going to be an obligation there is probably we projected out is still going to be roughly 300 million dollars and not in liability or obligation and it's going to be continued and to track and monitored every year 
after that. Just as it is now. I, I was just going to add, hopefully we won't be like the, uh, the Social Security system where it's it's not even funded at all. I mean, it, it, if, if we do our job um, as VIA and with the advice of an actuary continue to monitor and figure out a way to fund that unfunded liability, uh, even though those employees will live long past our 28 years of funded, hopefully what we have in the fund at that point will adequately fund any remining liabilities. I mean, that's the goal. Okay. And, and I just want to commend um, the job you've done in putting this whole um, transitional program together um, because it's very important to the sustainability of VIA. This is a significant cost, one of our operating costs, and hopefully it's a fair balance between um, making sure that we provide an adequate plan for the retirement of our employees and at the same time make sure from a sustainability issue we have a plan in place where we're not going to sit there um, at some point in time with an unfunded liability that there's no solution there's no way to fund it and it affects um, the overall viability of via going forward as a transit agency. So thank you very much for all your work in this regard. I'm going to provide, first of all, what's happened the last couple of years, and then we'll get into what, how did we get here, and what do we expect to see in the future. So two things to comment about on, uh, uh, for the last year, it's the investment experience, and then the liability experience. The investment experience for 2012 was was very refreshing and it was a, this is from October 1st to October 1st was almost almost 19 percent return this added an additional eight almost 18 million dollars in plan assets more than expected on a market value basis in terms of how the plan assets look at assets in the trust versus the liability it went from 52 percent to 58 percent and then on a liability basis what we do is we roll forward or we, we calculate what we expect the actuarial accrued liability to be each year. So we already have a number figured what we expect the liability to be October 1st, 2013. We get new data for new membership. We find out who's lived, who's, whose payments have stopped, and we recalculate a new actual liability and we compare the difference. Okay, And then these, these gains were, uh, were relatively small. And then if they did occur in 2011, it was on the positive side. The investment performance over the last 10 years. So there's two ways to look at this. You've got the you got the green chart, green bars is the actual experience. The red line is what the return assumption is. So if you have a green bar in excess of that, that's a positive year. Return was more favorable than what we assumed. If it's less than, then we call as an actuarial loss. Even it may be positive but it's less than what we assume, so it's considered an investment loss. Even though six out of the last 10 years, the actual re the returns for that year exceeded the, the expectation, what we're interested in is on the accumulation of assets, the compounding of the plan assets. And that's where we take a look at the average return. This is a geometric average. So the last five years was almost 2%, and then the last 10 years was 6.3%. This compares to a benchmark that used to be 8%, up to 2011 and it was decreased to seven and a half. So how's this look graphically, historical and, and forward-looking? The red chart represents the actual accrued liability, the, the obligation in the plan. The green line represents plan assets. This is the market value of assets, assets in the trust. And then the blue line is this calculated asset value that, that smooths out the, the short-term volatility over a five-year period. A couple things to note, events to note. So in the red line, you see an increase in 2005 to 2006 that was higher than normal. That was due to the plan change, the adoption, the increase in the benefit multiplier for those with more than 25 years of service. And then from 2011 to, or 2010, 2011, this was noted by the assumption change. In the green chart, when you see the decrease in uh, plan assets from 2007 to 2008, 
Um, this was the market downturn. Okay, this was a $40 million loss. Plan A said the return was $40 million less than what, what was anticipated or expected. In determining the funded ratio, the funded status, that's over the blue line. That, so we're not initially recognizing that immediately, but over time. And it's all fully recognized as of October 1, 2012. Projecting out, um, you know, on the, on the dotted lines, these are projected liabilities, plan assets, and of course they're projected out using the actuarial assumptions. The actual accrued liability is actually projected out fairly reliable. There's not a lot of variability or volatility in it. You can project that out with a high degree of certainty. The part that's uncertain is on the on the investment performance. It's whatever the markets and you know prevail. Let's look at plan contributions. So we got historical contributions, both the employee and employer. The solid portion represents contributions that have actually been made to the trust and then the dotted portion is, uh, is those planned or, or anticipated. Uh, the results of the 2011 valuation determine the contribution for fiscal year 2013 so that's the eight and a half million. There's a there's a two-year lag there it's just it's this amount's known it's budgeted for just actually hasn't been fully made okay we'll uh, we'll, we'll We'll fill it in when, when the total dollar amount's actually known and, and being paid for. The 2012 VAL determines the contribution rate for FY 2014. So this is the 11.6 million on the graph. And then next year's VAL, the 2013 VAL, what we're anticipating that that results to be is, is a contribution requirement of 13.2 million. If we look at the, the variability of the contribution due to investment performance, so contributions are known for certain for FY13, FY14, FY15 becomes the first year of where investment performance starts to make an impact. This is determined by 2013 VAL. And so what we provided is the green is what if returns are exactly as assumed. The red is what if our returns are less than assumed by 5% a year. And the blue is what if returns exceed the assumption by 5% a year. These charts are not meant, these, these upper and lower limits are not meant to be extreme positions. Returns can go above or below that. It's just meant to quantify or provide you an item sensitivity. How sensitive are the contribution requirements to investment returns? And over the short term, there's not a lot of sensitivity, and that's just because we, we recognize those gains or losses over a five-year period. It's gradually recognized. So when the 2008 investment market downturn occurred, VIA wasn't immediately impacted by increased contribution requirements. You could phase into, you could graduate into, and you knew they were going to occur, and you could budget for them. But on the flip side, when the plan earned 19% last year, you don't get to take that full credit immediately. It's, it's going to be recognized over the next five years. Can I ask you a quick question? Yes. And I noticed this is going to be our seventh amendment to our plan. Could you briefly, quickly kind of give me an idea what the previous amendments may have been and why? Orlando, you want to? So usually an amendment, we, we change a provision in the retirement plan. So the last amendment was the sixth amendment. Um, we were looking at providing a supplement for the retirees. Um, and we also increased the employee contribution rate. As, as you can see from the numbers, the employer contribution rate has been increasing. So we raised the employee contribution rate by 1%. On an annual basis, we will look and see if there's any funding available for the retirees, usually during the fall time. And we may uh, make a recommendation, whether it's a cost of living increase or a supplement for the retirees. So that's usually been the majority of the amendments before this point in time. Um, in 11, we also increased the employee contribution rate by 1% because of the numbers 
um, we were getting experience numbers from Danny. So we had decided to make a movement on that. We also changed the vesting time from, we had a graduated, once you reached five years, it would go up 10% a year till 10 years. So we lowered it down as a recruiting um, tool to just five year average. And we also closed the loophole where if someone had been over 55 when they started at VIA, they didn't have to have the five years with the company, they automatically vested. So we required at least a five year um, term before they would vest in that plan. So, you know, the, the s seven amendments coming up to this point uh, goes back t to the last plan restatement where we have our um, council look at all the tax laws and, ma and make sure the plan is up to date as far as that goes. So that, that's been the majority of the, the amendments it's in. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Just got uh, one, one last closing comments in, in this and let me explain my role and my position when making these is in terms of the actuary, my focus and concern is really the benefit security of the plan. When, you know, improving the benefit security, have a, working with management so they, they are no, have a causative agreement or, or purpose of getting, improving the, the plan's financial security. And that means attaining 100% funded status. You know, 80%, once you get above there, you're, you're at a point where you can, you can incur some adverse experience without significant cost increases. With the plan where it is funded now, any future adverse experience will further impact plan costs. And they will go up, they can go up significant. Um, so with that, my, my comments in terms of benefit <coughs> improvements, these would, in, these, would these would entail benefit amendments that increase the unfunded liability, have designed to, to increase the actual accrued liability or you're enhancing benefits currently provided by the defined benefit plan. So this would include things like subsidized early retirement, uh, increased benefit multiplier, or it could even include supplements and ad hoc colas. Okay, these are these are benefit improvements to, to retirees. Um, so I'd caution against that just because of benefit security. The amendment seven that they're going to discuss about going to the defined contribution plan, that one's different. That one does not increase the actuarial accrued liability. All it does is new, new employees who would otherwise come into the plan are now going to go to an alternative defined contribution plan. It does not impact the, actu the stability plan in terms of it's not going to increase the cost of maintaining the defined benefit plan. Mr. Chairman, yes. quickly, uh, in a conversation with our chief financial officer, I remember the, and, uh, comment that he made to me that I would hope that you guys would look at um, and make a recommendation on and that would be to use excess uh, sales tax revenue to help benefit the defined benefit plan. Could you consider that? Uh, Mr. Lange, you remember that off the cuff conversation what, that we didn't have? I, I believe the discussion you're referring to is simply um, getting into what options the board has when there are excess or revenues in a given year above what was in the budget and in June we'll be coming back to the board with the annual review of the funds policy that policy leaves it entirely up to the board discretion they can choose to do what they uh, desire with the additional funds one of those options uh, there is um, let me let me just let me just put this in context though Okay. Can we go back to the the slide that shows the trajectory of this? Mm, let's go back. Back, back, back. That's it. Those are the okay, right. That That's fine. So basically, this has been a discussion that has taken place over the course of four years. As fiduciary... Uh, uh, re ha accepting fiduciary responsibility for the retirement plan, we interact with our actuarial, right? We look at the, through committee and then as an executive committee and as a full board, we look at the trajectory of this 
retirement plan. Over the course of the last three years, we've seen some trends that we think go beyond what everybody has experienced in their retirement plan, which is the markets have been down. So we've discussed what those trends are in order to protect, right, to, to be able to say, given your advice to us, that in order to reverse mm -hmm. the negative trends in our existing retirement plan, we have to do Increase contributions. We have so. to increase contributions, which we have done, right, as employers. And then you really look at the change that we are potentially about to enact, which is to move from a defined benefit to a defined contribution. My, the question that I have about the, the last recommendation, which I myself also did not understand, right, okay. is that when you see if b by by now saying, before this date, everyone is in a defined benefit program. If the market reverses itself, which it appears to be doing, that, is ac that actually could be considered the additional funding to reduce the $141 million in uh, unfunded. Uh, absolutely, That's yes. the number one potential of reducing that unfunded liability, right, is making sure that our managers are doing a good job of taking it, of capturing the market trend. And so you began to see, right, mm -hmm. the reversal in that already. And you'll begin to realize the benefit of that over a period of time as you've described. Yeah. What other, I don't understand the recommendation, maybe you can help me understand that. For everyone who's a part of the defined benefit plan, what is, where, what is additional funding? I mean, where do you all, as actuarials, not as staff, see additional funding? I see additional funding. So, so the, the close of this unfunded liability is going to occur from two sources. You're either going to contribute more or it's going to come from investment gains, mm -hmm. like the last year. Investment gains, we already understand. We just talked yep. about That's that. Absolutely. So the additional funding is... I'm going to put this in the context of your 60% funded. You know, you have 60 cents of assets for every $1 of liability. So when I refer to additional funding, while you have a policy to fund this over a 28-year period, there's nothing that says you cannot put more money in. And so if you're going to earmark additional money... So then be realistic with me. Who, who has a 100% funded... Uh, zero liability <laughs> retirement plan. I know you said that. So we started during this term of office w in 2010 with a 70 percent funded plan and we've reversed that. Now that's gone down right. to where we're 50, Six, so you're 56 fi percent. Yeah, 50 what do you want realistically from a benchmarked perspective? Where should we try and be? If we were looking at ourselves vis-a-vis -vis other transit plans, Orlando, where would we want to be? So that when we look at this the next time and we begin to see the benefit of the revert of the positive trend in the market, where should we want to be? That's a great question, Mr. Chairman. And I asked that question of Joe Newton, who's the other actuary that works on our account. And the answer was a hundred percent. No, we're <laughs> but I my my <coughs> take on it was eighty percent, like Danny said. If you got to 80. When was the last time this plan was 80 percent? That would have been in 2006 before. Um, okay. Yeah. Would 32 million put us at 80 percent? Would 32 million put us at 80 percent? On what basis was the multiply? Can you, can, uh, that, would, that would be something not at this board meeting, but at a future board meeting I'd like to understand. Can you? Can you provide me with some historic context with regard to the change in the multiplier? Sure. Thank Absolutely. you. Go ahead, Mr. Pitch. I, I think just uh, as much as I um, try to not admit I was ever um, you were here. in the financial world and uh, CPA and whatnot, I mean, this is really the result of, and to put it in further context of what so many public entities and companies experienced with um, defined benefit programs where, you know, at one time, you know, it was not unrealistic to expect 10 
15 percent returns on assets. Um, it more than kept up with the additional benefits to retirees. The world has changed um, since, um, since I guess, you know, back into the late 90s, early 2000, when returns have come way down. And that's why so many plans are experiencing the problems they're having. So the, the prudent step that we've taken, um, which is, you know, making the change to a defined, benef uh, defined contribution plan, number one, and number two, trying to f come up with a plan to figure out a way to fund all these unfunded uh, liabilities that are out there. Um, the best thing that can happen to us at this point is that the market goes back to, you know, high yields, but um, I don't know anyone who's predicting that at this point in time. So we need to make sure that we have a plan. My, my fear is that we end up, you know, the market's at all-time highs again right now, that we, we run into another significant correction, which will just further exasperate the unfunded liability that we have. So, um, again, we should keep a eye on this year to year, adjust our plan as necessary, and hopefully uh, through a combination of our efforts to come up with a plan to unfund these liabilities as well as some enhanced market returns will find a way out of this over time. It would be extremely difficult to go back and amend that multiplier. It is better to look f to, to say from this point forward we're going to create a change as opposed to the people who bought into the plan accepting, you know, that the conditions were one situation and then go back and change that on them. So you all are bringing back, bringing forward in this next uh, action item the change that you think is important to maintain the long-term viability of the plan and try and get it, begin to get us back to where we need to be. And this is been the result of years and years and years of conversation between the board, the staff, the managers, the actuarial, the union, and the retirees, correct? Do I have a, do I have a motion to uh, accept the report as presented? Mr. Chairman, before that, may I make a comment, please? Mr. Martin. <clears throat> as obviously, I'm the oldest person on this board. <laughs> I've been retired from Crum and Forrester Insurance Company for quite a while. And my retirement plan is something that I'm very, very proud of. And that's something that I think anybody could get one like this. I draw retirement and I took a, a lesser amount, but if I should have been deceased earlier or even when I am, that retirement will continue to my wife until she's deceased. And I think that's an exception. And I took less in order to do that. But I think that's a very important thing and a very important consideration for employees. And our employees who are part of the defined benefit program have that option. Yes, they do. Thank you. Do I have a motion to accept the report as uh, presented? I have a motion by Catherine Thompson Garcia, and I have a second by Mr. Pitch. Any further discussion? All in favor? Motion passes. Item number nine. Again, Mr. Chairman, members of the board, uh, in trying to put all of these pieces together for retirement, we also looked at, as we closed uh, to new eligibility to other new employees, the defined benefit. We looked at opening the uh, defined contribution plan, which you uh, also have allowed us to do by consent. What we need to do today is to approve uh, a record keeper for uh, this. And so I have Patty Hafner here. So this is a new, a new uh, procurement item of somebody who's going to now be watching over our defined contribution plan. That is correct. Okay, so you're here to introduce yourself. Yes. Um, I'm Patty Hafner and I'm with the uh, Asset Consulting Group. We actually do investment consulting for both the defined benefit plan and are in the process of helping um, with, the, with this board with the decision of who to hire for the new defined contribution, the 401A plan. Um, I'll try to go through this presentation very quickly, but 
one of the things that we um, have done over the course of the last couple of weeks um, is to very quickly try to gather a lot of information on the providers that are out there. Uh, we did an RFP for um, for uh, investment um, and is there I don't know how to switch the okay you want to go to the we, we did this is the, the steps in the process that we took in terms of trying to come forward with the recommendation for you today. Uh, number one we looked at really all the providers that are out there we consult with about 75 different uh, plans like yours around the country, uh, about $45 billion in assets. So we do this every day. This is what we do. Um, we actually reached out to about 32 different uh, providers, uh, uh, defined contribution plan providers, um, about 12 of which we got some rec return you know, phone calls on. One of the hard parts about this particular search for you all is that it's a brand new plan. There are no assets in it today. So there are no real monies in terms of, of, of the startup. Uh, so from that perspective, that was a bit of a, a hindrance in terms of providers and whether they were willing to sort of put uh, you know, their time into this for several years before they really get paid a whole lot. Uh, but we did find four, really uh, uh, four very strong candidates uh, for this process. And we put them through some steps and gave them you know, an RFP for about 34 different questions calculated um, all of the answers to this and um, am coming forward with you today to give you some um, conclusions uh, from that whole search. Um, so obviously the process was more exhausting than that, but I don't really want to bore you with too much of the details unless you want to ask questions of that. Um, I want to go to the, uh, you know, on the next page I'm sh I um, outlined some information on each one of the uh, four providers that were very interested in becoming, uh, in working with uh, VIA going forward on this 401A plan. Um, the information they provided um, was um, lots of different uh, uh, aspects that were important to this whole search uh, in terms of the communications that they could have with the employees, the education process, uh, the um, payroll interfaces, and a lot of other, you know, very detailed information on how they could work with this system and, and, be, and coordinate with them. I will say from the standpoint of all four of these providers, um, we were able to, um, you know, really qualify all of them that they were capable of handling this assignment. So really, and I'm going to switch for a couple of different pages here to um, uh, Orlando, if you want to just go to, to the, the fee page, uh, because I'm going to flip forward to that uh, so that we can kind of get to the heart of the matter. Because in truth, all four of these providers are fully qualified to handle this assignment for VIA. So when it comes down to looking at the, the um, quotes that they gave us in terms of, of, of uh, how much this might cost to do, um, one of the things I want to say right up front is that when you deal with these different providers, they, there's a lot of different ways that they charge you fees. Uh, they charge you fees through the investment options that the individuals choose. They charge you fees in terms of education, perhaps, or in terms of um, you know the uh, 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 statements and, and lots of other different fees. So what we've tried to do is to aggregate all of that information into one number really for each one of the years going forward so that you could see how these fee proposals um, are, um, are comparable from one to another. And one of the things that I think stands out in looking at these numbers on this page is that um, you know what there are there are two in the middle, uh, including um, Nationwide and Great West, whose fee proposals are fairly much more reasonable than the other two in the first year. Uh, we did actually put together some projections for them so that we could actually look at it a couple years out as the plan assets grow. Um, but you know, I think the, the, the takeaway from that is that uh, those two providers actually charge all of the fees through the investment options. So in other words, whatever your participant chooses and the fees that are associated with that, um, they take a portion of that to actually do the service and re record keeping, but it's an all-in fee in those investment expenses. The one on the, um, the Vanguard, um, which is you know the big gorilla in the defined contribution space, and big gorilla in terms of probably having the most assets under management, um, actually has a different type of uh, process altogether they unbundle things. So they'll have very, very low investment fees, 
but they'll also charge you for the number of meetings that you might want to have on an education basis. Uh, they'll charge you extra for certain things like that. So again, I just wanted to um, reiterate that we tried to really compromise and get all of those fees um, incorporated. But into in the recommendation, it says that nationwide was the only. So you you broadcast the RFI, right? Yes. To how many firms? Twelve. And then out of the 12, four were, were responsive? Yes. And out of the four that were responsive, the only one that said that it could meet the implementation schedule was nationwide? Nationwide is the only one that could meet July 1st as far as an implementation schedule. And the reason for that is because they already have a relationship with VIA, very the, via the uh, 457 plan. If it hadn't been for that, would, you have, would the recommendation have been different? Uh, the fee no, I think the recommendation would have probably been exactly the same, especially initially here, because the fees are better than the only one that's even comparable to that is Great West, and you do have a relationship with Nationwide right now, and you know the kind of service and the education and all that you get, so you have a uh, you know a good feel for exactly how it's going to work out. So the what recommendation exactly is our relationship with Nationwide at the moment. There are 457. <coughs> Deferred compensation provider, and they have been for a number of years, yes, since we began the program here at VM. And the 457 plan has, what, about $25 million in assets in it today? So um, they're also, uh, Nationwide was willing to be even more competitive because they have that relationship. In fact, through our conversations just in the last couple of weeks, we've actually got Nationwide to come down on their pricing not only for this new plan, uh, but also for the 457 plan going forward. So uh, I think the process yielded some good results all the way around. So I guess long-winded answer to your question, but nationwide would be our choice. I, I don't understand the nature of the RF, what the recommendation again. So can I just ask that question? The sure. recommendation says that in 12 months you're going to come back Right, and you're going to reissue an RFI or an RFP for this because it looks like we ran up against a time deadline where the only respondent where who said they could implement per July 1. But how w that means you have to go out to, given our the way we normally do things, that that means you'd have to go back out to an RFP when to, to, to fit within that 12 month schedule. And really, will our asset base be significantly different by that point to inspire more competition? Not, not in the 401A plan. And you're, we're probably looking at about six months. You're right. But what we'd like to do is, is combine the two plans together and package a 457 and a 401A plan. So it'll be a lot more attractive out in the marketplace. We'll get more. Uh, competitive bids from from more providers. Do you need 16 months as opposed to 12 months? I mean, would that help? Uh, or I mean, 18 months. I mean, I'm just trying to get to where you're really going to. It doesn't make any sense to come back in 12 months if it doesn't make sense. I'm just I'm trying to get to what what's going to get you the most competition and get you, our the people who will benefit from this the best deal. <laughs> Well, I, I think 12 months would be fine because one of the things that we did not do in this process, we didn't have the flexibility to do, is to, is to tell a provider you could have both plans together. Right. So immediately you have, you know, 25 <laughs> or 30 million. Um, that, that's a whole lot different than zero, which is what this whole process is all about. So, um, you know, I think there's, you know, all, you'd always like to have flexibility, but I think it, it would be different um, if we were able to package those two together, which we did not have the time frame to do. Great. Thank you. Do I have any other questions? Do I so you're saying the nationwide will probably come back with a more attractive plan, given a little more time for us to put the plans together? I, I think actually the, the proposal that you have from nationwide is the best proposal for them. I don't think, I think if we did this a year from now, I don't think the nationwide proposal would change, uh, but I think others would change because they could look at actually having that extra 25 million in order to fund it. So I don't think the nationwide proposal, in fact, I, I will, I will say this about nationwide. They were um, incredibly um, 
uh, flexible in terms of coming down on pricing as we told them what we were seeing out there in the marketplace and you know quite frankly if they want and they were very very amenable to that so I don't think the nationwide proposal would change a year from now okay thank you thank you mr. chairman mr. pitch how many participants will we have in this plan initially <coughs> We have approximately 227 that are waiting to go into the plan. That that number is going to be increasing as, as we hire people. Sure. Yep. Uh, I guess, you know, we're, we're going from a situation where we have a, um, we're going to a self-directed plan, right? So we're going from a situation where um, employees really weren't involved in investment decisions to now they're directing their investment decisions. I guess my concern is, um, even if we weren't going to change in the short term, you know, what is going to be the education process? What's going to be the resource availability um, beyond nationwide or whoever it is? I, you know, many of us have been through a lot of these where um, your workforce really doesn't have access to the appropriate resources to help make investment decisions, encouraging investment decisions. And, th and this other issue of changing after 12, one, 12 months, um, I, I find a little concerning too. I'm not sure that there's another solution, but if we're going to go with one platform that those initial employees and the other ones that we hire are going to become familiar with and used to, and then 12 months later we're changing the, changing the platform that we may be using for their investments, um, it, you know, it, it becomes very difficult, especially for people that don't have a strong financial acumen, let alone people that do. So I, I, I would, would like to understand how you're going to handle it initially. I don't know if this is the forum to do it tonight, but how you're going to do that initially. And then if we do go through some kind of transition 12 months from now, you know, how you're, how you're going to manage that as well. Okay, we've we've sure. we've been having these employee listening sessions, and we've been explaining these um, concepts to them about the the whole year in this plan, defined benefit plan, or year in a defined contribution plan. So we've also been talking about healthcare and wellness and and things that are coming up in the future. So we will continue to do that, do that with our employees. Actually, staff would be available for that initially because of the relationship we have with Nationwide, we, we don't have the financial advisors on staff to counsel the employees, but Nationwide does. So they would handle the upfront, uh, as they do now today with the orientations. They come into the orientations, they'll do a presentation, and they'll sit down with each employee after that presentation, and they'll explain the options. If they need further counseling, they'll, they'll make appointments with them. Now, I'm not saying down the road we, we couldn't improve on that process, but that's currently the way it is, and we'll continue to support the employees in that role. Um, next year, we can include more education and, and training with, with the RFP component as well. Well, and I guess just to be clear, in the whole RFP process, one of the things that we made it very clear to all the participants here is that we expected some pretty heavy lifting up front when this thing, when this plan, new plan rolls out. Um, so I think Nationwide is on board with I think three, three to five people that will be available for, you know, weeks ahead of the launch of this new 401A. So hopefully that provides some comfort level that you'll be launching it at least with the, the greatest amount of effort. I you need a motion oh, on this to. I'm sorry. Go so ahead. moved, Mr. Chairman. I have a motion. Do I have a second? I have a second. I have a second by Mr. Martin. Any further discussion regarding nationwide? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Motion passes. Item number 10. Thank you very much. We appreciate your coming and explaining what your role is and, your, and uh, being here in person to help facilitate this transition. Mr. Hom, our five-year best shelter program. I've been told to uh, be brief as well, so pardon my acceleration, but uh, <clears throat> what I'm going to talk about tonight is a piece of the capital program that you're going to be seeing over the next couple of months. So this is draft. 
it's just as I said a piece of the overall capital program that uh, we'll be presenting over the next uh, few months to the board but it's an important piece because it's the place where our customers most intimately interact with um, uh, with our transit system you know 25 to 30 percent of their time is spent at a bus shelter uh, currently we have about 7200 bus stops of those 1400 have shelters another 3200 have benches and 2500 are poles only so it's about a 20 percent ratio shelters to stops that's about on par with uh, some of the other transit systems around the state it's much higher than dart it's about on par uh, on par with uh, Houston I think a little bit lower uh, than what um, uh, what cat Metro has and they have far fewer stops than we do uh, so if you look at that previous slide there was about 5700 that have benches or uh, poles so that's 5700 uh, 4700 are below the standards by which we would generally uh, provide a shelter uh, that leaves about a thousand that do meet the standard there are 76 that are awaiting a shelter uh, another 66 that we've already uh, made a determination that a shelter is not viable because of the right-of-way and so forth so that leaves about 900 uh, shelters or potential stops that could have shelters uh, through this program over the next five years we'll hit about half of those we will hit the half that have the highest number of riders so anything from you know 50 riders th 40 up to about 35 riders will have uh, shelters by the end of this five-year program uh, as you know we have a you know we have a wide variety of shelters the, Can the I ask a question, question about that? yes sir the lag is this a can you go back one so is that a what can what what is the reason behind this why are we not why are we not it appears like we're not where we need to be what contributes to that how we well, understand it uh part of the atd funding was to provide a greater amount of sheltering for customers and so since that time we have been adding shelters to the tune of now we have 1400 shelters so we've been adding a number of shelters and quite honestly this five-year program will bring us to the end of that process by the end of this five-year program for the most part we will have completed the shelter program we probably will not be expanding it that much further than this five-year program this will bring us to the end and once you have them you never go back and rehab them well part of what this program also does is to begin to replace the older shelters that were put in 30 years ago 20 years ago even some of the uh, tolar shelters those green shelters uh, you know we'll start hitting the first some of the older ones that were put in in say 2005 2006 some of those old tolars by the time we get towards the end of this five-year program but those brown domes will go away those OBSI's those will go away some of the advertising some of the historic arches those will go away not all of them some of them so if I get to the you know there's lots of mixes and matches there's some deluxe unique uh, kinds of stops out there as well um, the new shelter design okay um, this of course we recently completed uh, we put up two prototypes it's adaptable to the site it's modular so we can put it perpendicular to the road we can put it uh, uh, at a right angle to the road you can put one unit two units three units six units you can put them all together uh, it's a modern design it incorporates art and in mostly in terms of the roofing material you know the one at uh, Navarro and Commerce has a picture an old picture of a uh, uh, downtown location in San Antonio uh, it's powered for lighting it's uh, we can also make it solar and there's places where we can put large information panels uh, these are the two prototypes the one on the left at Commerce and Navarro the one on the right at San, uh, San Pedro and Myrtle 
uh, if you look at the survey results, uh, you know, we asked people to comment on them. We got 262 responses, uh, both online and in directly going to the stop and asking people. 32% of the responses were from people who had not visited the stop, so they were just doing it online. We asked them, well, is this better or worse than what was there? 49% say it was better, 11% worse, 16% neutral, 24% don't know because they don't know it was there before because they hadn't been to the stop. Uh, in general, the responses are have been positive. They like the design, it's clean, it's modern, although I will say you get also, it's too modern for San Antonio, uh, you know, but in general, most of the comments are positive. The major su uh, suggestions for improving the design is to provide a rear panel for wind and rain protection, like the existing uh, uh, shelters have, and also to avoid translucent roofing, roofing, which most people feel will not provide adequate shelter during the, um, particularly during the summer months. So we are going through uh, a process to design uh, a rear panel for the shelter and to see what that looks like. We don't have that quite yet. Hey, this is the five-year program that we foresee. If you go to the bottom right, you see it's twelve and a half million dollars over the five years. Uh, Can I ask a question about yep. this. Is the twelve and a, uh, and a half million dollars include uh, escalation in costs for inflation over between fiscal year fourteen and fiscal year eighteen, or is that all in? It's all in. Pardon? It's. It's Only averaged over the five years. We, we didn't put a specific, specific inflationary factor in there. So you don't have any inflation in it? No. So this is, may not be the right price. So then let me ask you, if you were, is there a way to, can we, could we think about approaching this differently? Sure. Is this a pay-as-you-go system? Are we taking money that we're going to find in our budgets over the course of the next few years and pay it as we go? Yes. Okay, so is there a, a different approach to it in terms of capital costs that could be bonded? Could we consider we're going to, we're going to, maybe there's a way of doing it all at one time and saving money. Maybe there's a, it just seems like maybe there's a way to address this. <laughs> you mean to accelerate it? it? Well, to accelerate it, make it more efficient, eliminate the, the inflation costs hire somebody to do, I assume we're going to do this in some kind of con construction contract. Yes. Maybe it's more efficient to do all of it at one time with one contractor as opposed to doing it over a period of time. My, my suggestion would be to go and look at alternative methodologies of paying for it or accelerating it. The intention was to go out and get one firm to build them, to manufacture them, and potentially to install them. It was only uh, a five-year program to spread out the $12.5 million. If you're saying that we should look at bonding it ways or to do it, in, well, you, I don't yeah. know whether we have the capacity, but we'll look at that. Ways to My gut tells me that between f with the way that co the construction costs are escalating, mm -hmm. that you're, this is not going to cost you twelve and a half million dollars if you do it between now and fiscal year eighteen. Okay. I, I I like the program. I'm in favor of it. I think you all should come back next month with some recommendation about how to deal with it differently. Compress it. Thanks. Got it. Anything Anyone else? else? I think we understand the look. We've seen it. Yes. So we drive by it. Anyone else? Thank you. Item number 11, VM Mobile application, Miss Engel. Good evening. 
We're here um, this evening to present to you the um, new VIA mobile app. It's going to be called Go VIA VIA. We're really excited about this mobile app and what it's going to provide for our customers and those who use the service. I am joined um, this evening by Steve Cerna, who's our manager of marketing promotions. And also with us is Mr. Tim Porter. He is the contractor who put the um, app together for us. And uh, he did a, a great job in helping us pull this together. He is a local vendor. We're really pleased that he was able to work on this with us. I also want to take a moment before we get started to uh, recognize Tony Cade, who handles, he's our chief information officer, and he, along with his staff, also did a great job in doing a lot of the technical back backup work that needed to happen to uh, get us to this point. And our goal is to officially launch this on Monday. We wanted to give you a preview of um, this app and what it's going to do for our customers. So I'll turn over to Steve. Thank you. Yes, we're very happy to be offer to be able to offer our first mobile app to our customers. Um, before I go into the features of the app, I wanted to give a brief background. As Priscilla mentioned, uh, Abdiction created the app. Uh, when we met with Abdiction, we um, talked about what are the priorities for the app, and what we use is um, what customers are currently using through our website as our priority for what we wanted the app to be able to do. And we also did um, brief surveys on social media to find out what customers would like to see in an app. Um, plus, we wanted to add the integration with VIA's new uh, real-time data that was available. 47% uh, of our riders right now currently have smartphones. Um, we have about 70% that have some kind of a cell phone, but 47% will be able to use this app. Currently, we get 16,000 text messages through our uh, real-time text message system that we added, we all added last year uh, per day. So we feel like an app is that the customers are ready for a full-service app. Once you capture that information, do you all have it to send information back? You get texts from your customer base, but do you have the ability to communicate back to them and by forming a database? Do you have 16,000 telephone numbers of your riders? We don't, we don't use it for that. We do have a subscription service that we have if customers wanted to sign up for alerts. Um, and we have a list of customers that do that. Mm -hmm. What is that? How many people is that? We're up to, I think, about 500. Mm -hmm. That's what does your Facebook page look like? Facebook, we have about 3,600 users or followers. That's a very low number, right, for this kind of... I've looked around at other transit systems, and they usually are around several hundred to a couple of thousand. So I think th our numbers are pretty good, uh, but we're adding to it. Recently, this past weekend, we had a lot of people that added to our Facebook page because of the communication regarding the flooding. And so as things happen like that, our customers become more in tune with what we're doing and are signing up. But we promote that on all of our materials and we try to encourage more uh, riders to sign up. Um, I think I went over most of this. We're developing an iPhone and Android app. Um, by far, most of our riders are either iPhone users or Android users. There's others, the Blackberry and the Windows uh, devices that um, are out there, but the majority of them are using iPhones or Android. When you launch, are you going to send a text to the 16,000? When you launch the app, are you going to send a text saying, hey, here's Via's new app? We don't uh, capture. You have to subscribe to do that. Right. For subscribers, we'll send that out. We're also going to be posting things on social media sites. We're having an event uh, on Monday to launch it, and we've got uh, materials ready for uh, customer outreach that we're going to have. We don't capture the 16,000. Uh, when somebody sends a text request to VIA, we don't capture that phone number. We have to put ask that Tony Cade. Why is that? It just seems like the whole world is moving toward more interactivity and what you're attempting to do is provide a benefit to your riders and so it seems like there's no interaction here and I, I think 
the more interaction you can promote, the more that you can communicate back and forth with your ridership, the better off we are. My question would be to whoever is, if you're not set up that way, why can't you? And, and, and it just seems to me, like how many people ride via on a daily basis? Keith. So we've got 135,000 daily users and about 3,000 people that we've connected to by Facebook that doesn't seem great. So. Um, Tim just mentioned that through the app, we will be able to, to push out notifications to people that do have the app. So once they get the app, we will have that ability to reach out to them <coughs> for alerts, but as well as for uh, any kind of other improvements that we do. Somebody's not looking at this. Right. So I want to go over the app real quickly. Um, the app uses the phone's GPS uh, signal, and it opens up a system of map of the area with uh, bus stops that are in that area around where that customer is at. From this screen, you can also activate or show the option of showing uh, satellite views, and you can scroll around the town just to look at other areas. Then once you see all the bus stops, you select your bus stop, and it will open up a screen showing the bus routes that are uh, predicted to arrive at that particular stop. From this screen, you can also set an alert. So if a customer is waiting for a bus that may be 15, 20 minutes away, they set that alert. And then when the bus is predicted to be two minutes away, the, uh, the app will notify the customer with, through a ping on their phone that that bus is now two minutes away from their stop. You can also look at uh, a map of the route and add that particular stop to your, frequent, your favorites list for our future trip planning. The trip planning function is, is uh, similar to what we currently have on Google Transit. Customers can enter from their favorites list or enter a new address and do a, a trip plan through the uh, interface with Google Transit. The, map, the app also has a complete system map of our service area as well as uh, downtown inset from the downtown area. So people can Great. zoom around in that. There's a tab that displays all of our bus schedules, our bus routes and uh, you can get schedules in PDF format. You can uh, look at a map of the route, and also you can see uh, detailed schedules for any bus stop in our system. There is a more tab that gives customers the ability to see our current rider alerts, to sign up for future rider alerts. Um, there's links to our park and ride facilities uh, and Facebook, Twitter, and YouTube channels. Uh, there's also a quick link under contacts for customer service, for uh, our transit police, um, and uh, lost and found. Um, I didn't mention it, but we also have a tab for, uh, that describes our passes and fares, and there's a quick link to our online store from there. Um, so we're planning a press event Tuesday, I believe, or Monday, I'm sorry. Um, and once that happens, the app will be uh, live on the App Store uh, for iPhone and Android users. And at that time, we'll also push out all the materials that we have ready for the customers. That's it. Do I have any questions by the board? Ms. Bersenio. First of all, just want everybody to uh, know who Tim is here because uh, He's done a great job with this. He knows his business, and he's done some other apps that uh, fall on the same line. So, do you? Is there anything you'd like to add? No, I just want to say uh, thank you guys for the opportunity. It's been great working with with, with Via, and um, and we're looking forward to other exciting apps. <laughs> it's always great when it's a <laughs> local San Antonio person. So, thank you. Absolutely. Um, I hope that we push this out through um, not just to our existing ridership, but I think that it has the potential of attracting more people to use the service, to use VIA, um, because since we can't manage uh, with as much frequency in certain scenarios, if you know, if you can determine um, when you need to go out to the bus stop, that solves half of that problem. So, um, so I think it's, you know, I think it's exciting, but I, I think we need to have broader exposure.
to the community. So. Mr. Pitch, do you plan on adding um, for us Windows users and BlackBerry users the app? So right now, research shows that I would say 79% of smartphone users, predominantly iPhone and Android. Um, but we do develop on multiple platforms, so if it ever came up, Windows. we can. Okay. <laughs> I, I, uh, the latest number I've seen is the Windows percentage has grown to about 20 or more. So yeah, Microsoft, they're doing a lot of advertising. But you have, I think, you have the capability to yes. get that done. Yeah, the, r the real point is that we don't want to shut people off be out because they don't, you know, don't have it. So I understand why you would hit Apple and Android first, but encourage us to add others and, and we also I mean, we look at this as a definitely our our introductory app I mean it's a good app we think it's very robust but we've also got a list a couple of page, pages long of improvements that we plan on making um, we're gonna get customer input and then start working on those version two I kind of want to follow up on what Mary said and apps like this are something that's allowing us also to go to writers of choice Besides ask, uh, adding a, it was remarkable when I heard the number 47% of our ridership have smartphones. And of course it's being user friendly and easing um, uh, more ease for our current ridership. But the idea that I know one of our goals is to go after the rider of choice. And I think this is one of those great ideas and an app like that would, would attract, you know, your rider of choice. Yeah, I, 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 yeah, like a great tipping point, uh, tipping point toward getting a lot more folks on on buses. Just one quick question, uh, in addition to everything that was been said, uh, the end user cannot alter the period of time, the two minutes, for the alert uh, to three or four. It's set at two minutes. Yes, but that's one of our things that we're going to look at modifying. Uh, we, we tested the app internally with some employees that ride the bus and that was one of the suggestions that we have that as a uh, customizable feature. Right. Yeah, I would think so. Thanks. Thank you. Looking forward to it. Item number 12, Mr. Smith. General Planning Consultant Services. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and, and Board. Um, item 12 is to uh, look at the request for approval to negotiate and award a contract with three firms for the General Planning Consultant Services. Uh, the staff anticipates the need for professional planning support services related to the implementation of the Long Range Comprehensive Transportation Plan 2035 and requires the services of consultants to provide the production and support for the multimodal transportation related planning services. Uh, uh, staff went out with a request for proposals and uh, nine uh, proposals were received. Uh, these repro proposals were um, evaluated by uh, via uh, evaluation committee uh, composed of via staff uh, from the nine, uh, it was recommended that six firms uh, be invited to come back and to make presentations uh, to the uh, uh, technical evaluation committee, along with an advisory panel uh, from the from the board. And um, uh, from these six, uh, we reviewed not only the proposals but listened to the um, uh, presentations made, along with. Uh, reviewing and looking at project evaluations from uh, performances with the firms and uh, we had long discussion uh, among the <coughs> the committees and the advisory panel and uh, uh, Cambridge systematics IDC and Parsons transportation group were the three that um, that we were recommending uh, that uh, from from this process uh, we're request staff is requesting re recommendation to uh, for the CEO uh, pr president and designee to negotiate rates and award contracts to the to these three firms for the general planning uh, support services uh, I might make a note 
that uh, VIA will establish the DBE goals or small business targets for task orders uh, with the federal funds and the SB participation for the task orders funded by, the, by local dollars. And this will be done as the uh, task orders and scope of work is developed. There's a resolution uh, along with your um, agenda item. Move for approval of staff recommendations, Mr. Chairman. I have a motion. Do I have a second? Second. Second. I have a second. Any conversation, discussion, the question? The board advisory members were in agreement with the uh, evaluation committee. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Motion passes. Modern streetcar update, Mr. Buchanan. Good evening, Chairman, members of the board. Um, with me this evening is Mr. Kyle Cahey with HNTBR Program Manager and Mr. James Brown with HDR who has done some of the economic development um, analysis you're going to see this evening. This evening we'd like to walk you through another criteria point on our way to getting to the locally preferred alternative and that is the economic development criteria. So with that, I'll turn it over to Kyle. Thank you, Brian. Mr. Chairman, members of the board, a uh, pleasure to be here again this evening. Uh, there's four main points we want to address with you this evening. Just a quick recap on the schedule, a uh, recap of some of the meetings and stakeholder discussions we've had in the past month since we were last here. And also we're going to focus this evening on the economic development uh, criterion uh, that James will be able to address this evening. And all of this is, is moving toward next week's uh, board workshop we will, where we will have a very intensive uh, examination of the entire spectrum of, of criteria for the streetcar project. Uh, this is the schedule that you've come to know and love by this point in time. We are halfway through the process. If you remember, we started with the universe of alternatives, 16 different alternatives. We evaluated those 16 through a conceptual level uh, analysis. We have arrived at the six detailed alternatives that you have in your packets at your desk this evening. Since April, we have been diving into uh, the evaluation of those six uh, alternatives and comparing them against the, the uh, evaluation criteria that uh, we've uh, presented to you in prior uh, meetings. But again, I want, do want to highlight that next week we will have our workshop and then next month, the next two months actually, are very, very heavy lifting where we will have all the information in front of you and we'll move toward a locally preferred alternative in the July-August time frame. Very quickly, we, the last month we've had some great opportunities to meet with some of the local stakeholders. Uh, I, I will just recap this very quickly. I know we have a lot of things yet to cover on the agenda tonight. Uh, we did meet last month with the San Antonio City Council during their B session, so we had a great opportunity to have a good lengthy discussion with them. Uh, during that uh, session, we had several uh, council members that were opposed to us uh, going in front of the Alamo, and they were also generally supportive of using Cesar Chavez as opposed to going uh, along Goliad through Hemisphere Park. That was a con con consistent theme that we heard throughout several of our meetings uh, over the last month. The other thing the City Council wanted to make very clear to us is they wanted to make sure that we were seamlessly uh, integrating the streetcar uh, with the Primo and the local bus network. So we took that comment away from them. Dur with Bear County, we had several sessions with the county judge as well as staff. Uh, we, again, we had the same message regarding avoiding going in front of the Alamo and going through Alam uh, Hemisphere Park. Uh, and they were very interested in the southern leg of the uh, alignment on St. Mary's going south of Cesar Chavez, which Alternative 6 uh, did not do initially. The City of San Antonio has formed their own internal technical committee. We met with them last month and we're set to meet with them again. Uh, they had their comments that focused on the economic development criteria that James will be able to address here in just a few moments. Uh, but we did get a good so sign off from them. They're very happy with our uh, methodology approach. Uh, now we'll see if they're happy with our results as we you know, share that with them in the coming couple of weeks. One of the other uh, key groups that we met with was uh, the uh, Texas General Land Office and the Daughters of the Republic of Texas. 
Uh, they were very, very interested, of course, in the plan for in front of the Alamo. We did get an official letter from the commissioner uh, saying that he was opposed to the alignments that were in front of the Alamo, uh, given their vision for what the Alamo is, is uh, uh, out there in the future. The San Pedro Creek Executive Committee, there's a lot of plans for uh, that they that are very much in the early stages and they wanted to make sure that we are coordinating with them uh, as those plans evolved. And then on the heels of Fiesta itself, we had an opportunity to meet with the executive committee of the Fiesta Commission. A uh, couple of big challenges there as we go up and down Broadway. Uh, you can see that they're generally supportive of the project, but they did want to make sure that their ability to have the parades on Broadway were allowed to go forward uh, and then we'll have to use uh, some some approaches to be able to deal with those addresses as we go forward. So very quickly, uh, the screening of the detailed alternatives, you've seen this, this, this uh, slide a couple of different times. You'll recall that we identified several primary factors and secondary factors. We addressed last month the secondary factors. Uh, that's the box contained in red. The primary factors, uh, we are still putting the finishing touches on. We had a good work session today and we are preparing to bring all of that uh, to you uh, on next Monday when we meet uh, as, as, a, as a group to go through the workshop. But we did want to bring today, we want to bring forward the economic development potential criterion for a little bit of a, of a discussion, give you a little bit of a preview. And I do want to re reiterate that we'll be able to address all of these factors in the workshop in detail uh, next Monday. So what I'll do at this point is turn the presentation over to James Brown with HDR, who's been uh, working on uh, this uh, economic development potential criterion. Good evening, Chair, uh, members of the board. Uh, what we looked to do uh, with the economic development potential was really look at uh, the ongoing current activity as well as policy uh, and investment support located within 500 feet of the road alternatives. Uh, the 500 feet criteria generally gets you to somewhere around a block, block and a half distance. It's a pretty standard distance that most of the research shows uh, is where you see the most economic development impact from streetcar projects. It tends to be linear uh, as opposed to more nodal and some other uh, fixed guideway systems. Uh, we identified five categories of economic development character and dynamics. Uh, we had a stable category which we divided into two which were transit demand. These are generally employment centers uh, and cultural areas. These are generally attractions that people visit. Uh, we also identified transitional areas, planned redevelopment, and potential redevelopment. Those are what they look like there. Just to kind of go into a little more detail on these. Stable areas are they're generally built out and they have things going on there that are already generating activity, whether as a destination or a source of riders. Um, so these are areas where you're not expecting a lot of major development, but these are the things that you want to link your development areas to. So that's where their importance is. Uh, transitional areas are areas that are currently experiencing investment under construction uh, and there's potential ridership generators there whether as a source of riders or as a destination for riders. Uh, potential, these are areas where uh, the activity isn't currently happening um, but where it has been expressed there's large levels of common property ownership uh, and there's good potential um, for development due to access from streetcar. The final category is planned. These are areas uh, that are that have the similar high development potential uh, where there are actually active implementation plans for redevelopment ongoing. So these are varying levels of activity, both those that are places that are already developed, generating demand and or riders, as well as those places that are on the path to doing so in the future. So we looked at weighting these areas uh, in these corridors. Uh, the stable areas, both uh, the, the, uh, uh, the, the employment centers as well as the cultural areas, uh, we're weighted times one. These are things we want to connect to, but they're not going to give us a lot of development potential. There's not going to be new development in these areas. Uh, transitional areas where we see things already happening, these are places we want to connect to. Um, or however, they're already developing, so they don't need as strong of support as maybe some other areas do. So they got a one and a half times factor. Uh, areas with potential um, and the planned areas both get a higher factor of 1.75 and 2.0 and that these are the areas that are trying to happen, want to happen, want to absorb some of this demand. We're trying to guide demand to these locations, um, you know, and help shape demand uh, by putting the streetcar near them. So they were weighted a little more heavily for that. In addition to development activity and things that are going on, we also wanted to try to make sure that our routes were covering those areas that other policies, uh, other fiscal tools were being used to support development. Those graphics on these pages don't mean anything yet, right? They're just pictures. Okay. 
a little bit of color for you. Got it. So um, I in this case, the main two area areas were uh, the public improvement districts, um, you know, that, that covers most of downtown, the downtown pit, uh, as well as the various tax uh, increment reinvestment zones, the TERSs that are, that are throughout the area. Uh, again, what we're trying to do is you're, you're making a decision on a large infrastructure investment, a capital investment. You should clearly make this investment follow where you're putting other resources, namely these fiscal tools, these uh, tax-based tools that you already have in place. So how do we come up and how does this all work together? So we take our formula and we look at it. Uh, we look at the multipliers on there, and this, of course, makes it you know look a lot more complicated than it is, but it's, it's pretty straightforward. You take your stable areas times one, and those are the two different areas, the two different types of stable areas. The transitional times one and a half, uh, the other, uh, the potential development areas times 1.75, and the plan times 2.0. Uh, and then you add the, uh, the TERS and PIT in all of these areas as well with no multiplier, and you divide that by the route miles. So basically what we're trying to say is how many acres of area do you have within each of these corridors where you have high levels of development activity as well as uh, current policy tools in place per mile. Can, can I ask a question about this, Brian? Are, are we going to get this? Is that, that's on Monday again? Yes, this is part of the Monday conference. Okay, because it's really late, <laughs> and so there's a lot in here. I, I could probably keep us here for an hour asking you all questions. I'm not going to, <laughs> because we still have an executive session, but is this, is all of this in there? I have a lot of questions for you on this formula and economic development. I could go back and start asking about the relationship with the city on this. Sure. Given the general land office letter, what happens with the city's commitment to the eight million on Alamo? I mean, I had a ton of questions for you. So, how do y'all, how do you want to handle it? You're going to bring this up on Monday. This will definitely be available to us on Monday as, as part of the conversation there. Um, and just run through it okay. quick and get over with it, and we'll come and let's talk about it in detail on Monday. Well, we're getting pretty close to wrap, wrapping up here, as you can see. This is how the six alternatives compare. It's not a huge amount of differentiation, although you do see uh, four of the alternatives kind of separate themselves out as having a, uh, a larger amount of these areas that are uh, experiencing strong development and development potential and also seeing a concentration of these policy tools. Um, and again, here's what it looks like uh, on a per mile basis, and you see it really start to level out. Uh, I don't understand standpoint. what the connection, for example, just to tell you, like one sure. of the, I don't understand the connection to the PID. If the PID doesn't in some way, I mean, is there conversation with the city that if this, if the routes are in harmony with a PID or a TERS, that there's going to be some synergy between them? I mean, I don't get it. I don't understand how that, how that makes a route more valuable if there's not a conversation or a, or an ex, you know, a, an agreement of some kind that that positively impacts the development around the streetcar line. I mean, you can be in a PID and that PID or that TERS and that TERS be completely committed for the for the period for a, an extended period of time, it doesn't do anything any good. Well, correct, and, and that we're not we're not trying to look at it as a resource based to fund streetcar. But it's in your formula. No, no. But what we're looking at is this: if you think about what the PID does now, right? It, it you know cleans up the streets. But it, you shouldn't have it like do the opposite, which is if you're not in a PID and you have the ability to implement one that actually cleans, does clean it up. I mean, never mind. Yeah. Well, uh, okay. Yeah. No, no, no. I'm gonna. Well, the, the notion. The notion. Uh, this is this is an example of. I had a lot of questions okay. for you. Great. All right. Well, we can talk about it next week. I'm I'm not in favor of this formula yet. This is what okay. I'm telling you until I really understand it. Okay. Okay. We're not gonna look at from as an individual. I'm not there with your economic development criteria until I understand it better. I'm glad you brought it. Okay. And you can give every. I would suggest you get send a copy to everybody in advance. Of Monday. Okay. So um, that really uh, that, that wraps it up right there. If you can see how they. Okay. They Thank you. <laughs> yeah, we had, we had made that request already. So from PPD. Okay. That pardon. The time is now. 
810 and the Via Metropolitan Transit Board of Trustees will officially go into a closed executive session. The items we will discuss during this executive session are as follows. Item number 14, discussion and possible action regarding president and CEO candidates, which is an executive session item pursuant to the Texas Government Code Section 551.071 entitled consultation with attorney and Section 551.074 entitled personnel. And also item 15.A entitled real estate, US 281 North, Stone Oak Park and Ride. I'm not going to go through reading all of them, which is an executive session item pursuant to the Texas Government Code, Section 551.071, entitled Consultation with Attorney, and Section 551.072, entitled Real Property, and Item 16, entitled Legal Briefing, which is an executive session item pursuant to the Texas Government Code, Section 551.071, entitled Consultation with Attorney. All persons who are authorized to attend the executive session, please proceed to the small conference room. The time is now 9.30 and the VIA uh, uh, Board of Trustees is coming out of an executive session. No uh, deliberation of public policy occurred during that executive session. Do I have a motion for um, item 15A? Move to accept the I have a motion from Dr. Gambetta. Second. The resolve the President and CEO or his designee is hereby authorized to negotiate and execute a sales agreement with Dallas Miller and spouse Julie D. Miller to purchase fee simple title to the following described real property under terms and conditions. The President and CEO deems acceptable, the price of which shall not exceed four million five hundred and twenty thousand to it a 6.481 acre tract of land located in the city of San Antonio, Bear County, Texas, made up of six plotted lots located adjacent to the southwest corner of US Highway 281 and Stone Oak Parkway and legally is described as follows. <laughs> lot 1, 2, 3, and 4, Block 25, New City Block 19219, Cactus Bluff Commercial, Unit 2 in the city of San Antonio, Bear County, Texas, according to Platt thereof, recorded in 9559, page 163, Dean Platt Records of Bear County, Texas, save and accept that part of said lots conveyed to the state of Texas by deed recorded in volume 11133, page 1477, Real Property Records in Bear County, Texas. Lot 5, Block 25, New City Block 19219, Cactus Bluff Commercial 3, in the city of San Antonio, Texas, San Antonio, Bear County, Texas, according to plat thereof, recorded in volume 9636, page 180, deed and plat records of Bear County, Texas, lot 6, block 25, new city block 19219, Cactus Bluff Commercial 3, in the city of San Antonio, Bear County, Texas, according to the plat thereof, recorded in volume 9574, page 31, deed and plat records of Bear County, Texas. <laughs> I second the motion. I have a motion by Dr. Gilbert. And a second by Mr. Pitch. Is there any further discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Motion passes. Move for There's no more legal, uh, no more executive session, no more legal briefing. That brings us to item number 17. Do I have a motion for adjournment? Move for adjournment. I have a motion for adjournment by Mrs. Bersenio and a second by Mr. Miller. We stand. Adjourned. The time is now 9.34, and we will call to order this meeting of the Board of the Advanced Transportation District. Item number three, the we'll consent, agenda. Approval of the consent agenda. I have a motion for approval by Mr. Miller. Do I have a second? I have a second by Mr. Pitch. All in favor? Aye. The motion passes. Item number four, MPO Policy Board. Composition, which we've heard uh, in our previous meeting of... Uh, <laughs> at VIA, does anybody feel the need to discuss this item any further? There are no action items associated with this item. That brings us no legal briefings. Item number six, adjournment. I have a motion for adjournment. I have a motion for adjournment by Mr. Pitch and a second by Catherine Thompson. We stand adjourned. <laughs>